podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Saturday, May 9th, 2020. This is episode 1693. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast comes to you from Twit's LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees? LastPass can ensure they are by making access and authentication seamless, whether they're working in the office or remote. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. This episode of The Tech Guy is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Now that a lot of you are working from home, it's even more important to choose a VPN you trust. Well, I'll tell you what I trust, ExpressVPN. For three extra months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash tech guy. And by Simply Safe. Simply Safe is everything you need in a home security system with its award-winning protection. Go to simplysafe.com/twit to save on home security today. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today, Leo Laporte here, the tech guy? Yes. <laughs> the world goes on and the tech guy part of it, we shall continue to talk about high tech. Today, 8888 ask Leo the phone number as usual. As it has been since 2004, it will continue to be so. 888-827-5536. That's toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada if you want to talk about high tech. Well, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. Let's talk high tech. 8888-ASK-LEO. There's a website. We put everything there so you don't have to write anything down as you're listening. That's techguylabs.com. Techguylabs.com. There's also um, a chat room. If you're looking for a little companionship, yeah, it's, you know, <laughs> it's text. It's plain old text. You don't have to put on makeup. You don't have to put on pants. You can just hang out at irc.twit.tv, irc.twit.tv. And I, I mention that because I spent a lot of time on Zoom this week. Did you? Yeah, I think a lot of us are Zooming. I Zoom with my family. I Zoom with colleagues. I Zoom with friends. I even did a college reunion Zoom yesterday. <laughs> uh, it was fun. But I noticed yesterday was a bad day. How much? How many Zoom calls did I do? Three, I think. Something like three or four hours sitting at my computer Zooming, tele video conferencing. It's fatiguing, isn't it? It's harder than doing a radio show. I thought, oh, I should be a pro at this. I do this for a living. But there's something about it. I don't know what it is. Staring at that grid of faces. <laughs> Isn't it? Am I? Is it just me? Are we getting zoomed out? It's, I mean, on the one hand, without fi FaceTime and Duo and Zoom and WhatsApp and all the different ways we can uh, chat with one another, uh, this would be so hard, you know, just sitting at home. <laughs> alone i mean it'd be tough so it, i mean i can't complain that we have friends and family and i can have a college reunion people i haven't seen in 40 years uh get together and uh, and chat we had a wonderful time it's just like those 40 years in between hadn't existed it was really cool it's still exhausting i went <laughs> i went to bed and i just went oh <laughs> that was an exhausting day You'd, you'd almost you'd almost rather dig ditches, maybe not. P put up fence posts, maybe not. Work in a grocery store, maybe not. You'd almost rather. You almost would. So sometimes technology is a good thing. Sometimes it, too much, too much. I think that's it, isn't it? Too much tech is a bad thing. Too much streaming media. Too much YouTube. Too much Twitter. Whew, too much Facebook. Oh my. You gotta, you gotta at some point disconnect and get up and, and and walk around and maybe even go outside. Put your mask on. Go outside. Breathe the fresh air. This is, I think, is an important antidote to the silicon buzz that we're all staring at all the time. Just you know, just relax a little. Take it easy. 
Uh, I could tell you about more conferences that have been canceled. It's kind of funny, actually. There's a running gag every year trying to, trying to sucker the noobs that the big hacker convention in Vegas, DEF CON, is canceled. Hoping that, <laughs> I don't know what, it'll fool people and they won't go. <clears throat> this year it's actually canceled. It's actually canceled. Of course it is. Would it, would it happen in August? It's a, a really kind of, I've never been, but uh, I have many friends who go, and it's a very cool convention because, well, it's just kind of outrageous, right? And there's all sorts of hacking going on, and <clears throat> you can get hacked too. They have something called the Wall of Sheep. If your system gets hacked, they put, they put your name <laughs> up on the Wall of Sheep. So uh, most of the people I know who go to DEF CON and, and it's Big Brother Black Hat, both put on by the same uh, guy, um, don't bring anything important. They don't bring their regular laptop. They don't even bring their regular phone. They definitely don't bring an Android device. They just <clears throat> they go the safest way they can because they don't want to end up on the wall of sheep. No. Yeesh. Other, I guess I, you know, I don't. I'm trying to avoid the COVID news. You get, we get plenty of that all day long. I don't need more of that. But I guess a couple of things worth saying. One, Google has now uh, announced uh, we're not going to make anybody come in to Google to work for the rest of the year. Facebook's done the same thing. You don't have to come back in 2020. That is wild. I mean, this is Mrs. May. It's May, the fifth month of the year. That's seven more months of working at home. And I wonder after after a year of working at home, effectively, almost a year of working at home, if people are ever going to go back. Remember when um, Yahoo had a CEO change a few years back and they, they brought in Melissa, Marissa Meyer from um, Google, a very famous uh, Google executive, and they brought her in to, to transform Yahoo. She failed, incidentally. Spoiler alert. Couldn't do it. Ended up selling the whole thing to Verizon for pennies on the dollar. But <clears throat> going back to when she first took over and uh, there was much hope and excitement, she was going to transform the place. Yahoo, you know, one of the great names of the early days of the Internet. What's the first thing she did? She made everybody who was working from home come back. Can't work from home, she said. Not efficient. Not going to work. Not going to do it. Mm -mm. You coming in. We've got a place for you. Here's your badge. Have a seat. Then the other thing the Silicon Valley companies do is they don't even give you an office, <laughs> which means you're all sitting at, at long tables and wide open spaces. Exactly the worst thing you could be doing, sitting across from your coworkers, talking, eating lunch, <laughs> spitting, <laughs> hacking in a hue and sneeze and coughing, and there you are sitting there exposed all day. It's the it's literally the worst possible scenario for catching a bug and i don't mean just covid any bug right that's why whole offices come down we we had that uh, a few months ago here in the uh, twit studios and there's only about 20 25 of us it's not a big group but uh, there was a you've had this happen right a bug raging everybody got it i didn't Washed my hands, stayed in my office. Because I have an office, see, I don't have to sit across from people, and I think that's part of the problem. So what's going to happen next year? Companies worry that they can't control. I know, I'm, gonna, I'm a boss, I, that you can't control workers at home. You, I, I know how bosses think. You think, oh, you know what? He's not working. He's sitting around eating Doritos and watching cops reruns. He's not working. I bet he hasn't put on a shirt even in, in weeks. He's not doing anything. We don't we don't like people working from home. There's another reason when you're when you're in tech industry, there is value to the collaboration that happens uh, when you are sitting across from one another. Or you're, in fact, Steve Jobs, when they first designed the Apple campus way back when the Circle campus that they're now in, he he only had two bathrooms, <laughs> and his theory was, well, people really need. To, I don't know what his theory. He was kind of loopy. But <laughs> people, he wanted people to spend time together, not even people who are working on the same project, but more importantly, kind of cross pollinization within the company of ideas and, and, and strategies and just kind of, he wanted people to be together. 
And you know that it's a, it makes a lot of sense. One of the reasons they say San Francisco became this tech hub uh, some years back was because they were all kind of in the same area, the South Park area, and they were all kind of hanging out. And there was this cross pollination. It's not just that all the engineers are there, but that they all have lunch together in different companies. And there's a there's really some value to that. Well, that's gone. Now everybody's at Google's going to be at home in their jammies eating those uh, fiery hot Cheetos. I don't know. Right, well, what will happen? What will productivity look like? I think some some people prefer it, but you don't have that you don't have that collegiality, that collaboration. And I I, I don't think Zoom, I'm sorry after now having spent many days zooming. I don't want to zoom. Can we not zoom? I don't want to do phone calls either. You know, I just <laughs> Leave me alone. Leave me alone. I am actually glad that I am uh, closer to retirement age than, than starting work. My kids, both my kids just got out of college. What are they going to do? They're, they're, they don't know what they're going to do. How do they get a job? I don't know. There's jobs, but maybe not the kind of jobs they want. They don't want to work in an Amazon warehouse. I don't blame them. 8888-ASK-LEO. What do you think? Are you, are you zoomed out? And should people work from home? We could talk about anything on your mind. Your tech is my problem. I'm your tech guy. I'm here for you, my friend. 888-827-5536. Website, techguylabs.com. And, uh, of course, the chat room. As I mentioned, lots of nice people. There are good people in there. On both sides. irc.twit.tv. It's Kimmy Schaffer, our unbreakable phone angel. It's the Schaffer Show. That's if you ever have a radio show, that's what you should call it. It's the Schaffer Show. You know what's funny is I I thought if I ever made it in radio, I would change my name to like an no, alias. It's, it's a great name. Because <laughs> I thought Schaffer was just too cumbersome. But it's kind of, when I started in radio many, 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 many years ago, you didn't use your own name. You know, you were no, that's Dapper the, Dave, you know, or whatever. Well, and the anonymity of it all, too. I, maybe it was anonymity. I think it was also like, you know, I'm Johnny Walker. Yeah. You know, Dr. Johnny Fever. Uh, you had to have a name. Dr. Donald T. Rose. <laughs> I yeah. was, uh, when I first started, I had to come up with a name like pretty darn quick. Mm -hmm. I came up with such a zinger, such a name, oh, no. such a what peppy name. You'll never name? forget it. Dave Allen. Dave Allen. Oh. Oh. Boring. <laughs> oh, my God. I don't know what I was thinking. Anyway, I am now my own name. Yes, and that's a good thing. Yeah, it's better these days. We use our own names. Mm -hmm. So, Kim, <laughs> uh, let me think. Uh, what would you? What would your name be if you um, were going to be? You know, at one point... I think I was thinking of like Conway because it just seemed to Kim flow. Kim Conway. <laughs> I don't know. Kimba Conway. How about Kimba Conway? <laughs> or Simba Kimba. Yeah. Kimba. Oh, hey, oh, hey, oh, hey, oh, Isn't that hey. like a white lion or something? Yeah. Okay. Hey, uh, maybe I should take a call. What do you think? <laughs> just off the rails. Well, I think Tom in Milwaukee just has like a plethora of questions. I feel like so. I'm on a Zoom call with you. This is terrible. <laughs> we could do the whole show like this. So you said Everybody your friend th out. heard me say, I don't want to Zoom anymore, thought I didn't want to take phone calls. No, 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 no. I'm still going to do the radio show. That's different. <laughs> this is easy compared to a Zoom call. Easy. I just, uh, I don't know what about a Zoom call. I think it's the grid. I think it's 20 oh. people looking at you. There's that, and then what? Every time somebody talks, it kind of mutes out. Yeah, that, that's you have to have too. kind of rules about talk. You know, like you need a talking stick. And watching something. these TV shows use that and do a TV show is. Really Although I have to say, I've been enjoying the ads. Have you seen? There've been a few Zoom ads, yes, like uh, the, uh, uh, the insurance one. Geico's Flo. doing it. Flow. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of enjoy <laughs> those. I have to say, those are pretty funny. That's an opportunity. And Saturday Night Live has done some fun parodies. Anyway, let me let me talk to Tom. Nice to see you, Kim. <laughs> you that was too. it. That was our our, our weekly check in. That's it. We're done. Hello, Tom. Thank you, Kim. Leo Laporte, the Hi. tech guy. Hello, Leo. It's Tom. Hey, Tom. <laughs> hey, quick, 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 two or three questions. Sure. Um, 
started in VHS, then went to Laserdisc, then went to DVD, then went to Blu-ray. So I'm wondering how much better <laughs> the 4K discs are than the Blu-rays. Well, they're, they're, they're twice as good. They're four times better. <laughs> That's a good question. So they do have new uh, discs, uh, new formats called UHD or ultra high def. Which right. is Blu-ray times two in each uh, direction. So twice as high resolution horizontally and vertically. So it's four times the number of pixels. But even more importantly, I think, in the new UHD format, is something called high dynamic range. Uh, HDR, you'll see it abbreviated. And what it is, is the, the brightest brights, the difference between the brightest brights and the darkest darks, the difference is larger so you get much richer blacks, much brighter, almost almost eye-hurting bright highlights. And it, the, the reason they want that is your human eye has this very wide dynamic range. I can't remember what it is, 12 stops or something. And, and, and traditional video can't do that. There's something like seven or eight stops. So if you can get even a stop or two more, stop is how you measure brightness. If you can get a little bit more, it looks a little more realistic. It's more like, and that's the difference you'll see when you look at a UHD disc. It feels like you're looking at something more real, but you have to have the TV for it. And not just the TV, you have to have everything in the chain has to be 4K for you to, to, to see this. And I wish we didn't, you know, 4K and UHD are, are the same thing, but they're not technically interchangeable, but I'm using them interchangeably. They are the same thing. Now, here's the real problem, Tom. Right. You've already been down this road, haven't you? How many times have I bought the Beatles music on on, on, on vinyl, on cassette, on 8-track, on CD, on digital? We're at, finally, I think, the end of the line for what we call what I call physical media. The VHS tapes and the CDs and the DVDs. As we get higher speed internet connections, I think the, the difference, you know, a true video file will say, oh, Leo, you ignorant fool. Don't you know a UHD disc is there's nothing better? True, perhaps. But given how easy it is to just stream it in 4K, if you have enough bandwidth, I think that's probably the way we're going to go. I don't think physical media has much of a future anymore. So, so related to that, I also have uh, a ton of movies on iTunes. Yeah, those are 4K, and UHD, and HDR. The only limitation is they, in order to get down the pipe, they have to be compressed. You need to have, and on 4K, Netflix says 25 megabits per second. I'd say even a little bit more. But even then, it's not exactly as good as the disc. I think it's fine. I think it's fine. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Property pie. Hello, Scotty Wilconson. Hello, Leo. You could you How could weigh you? in on that topic if you wish as well. Sure. The replacement of physical media with streaming. What do we give up? I just feel like I, I think you handled you handled it very very well. My you, issue, you, you said basically what I would have said. Going, you know, I'm thinking back when I had albums, music albums, <laughs> and if you never ever have to move, and you're never going to die, <laughs> <laughs> then having a wall full of LPs is fine. It's cool. It's great. Mm -hmm. But if the minute you have to move them, you go, what have I? Oh. Been? Man. You can only put a, so many in a box before it gets too heavy. Same thing with right. books. And I love books. I'm probably going to always have a bookshelf with books. Right. But I think physical media is just so – it's so inconvenient compared to digital media. Well, and even if you don't move, you you have to get up. You have to go get the disc. You have to put it in, uh, spin up the drive or the – turntable or whatever and it, with with records you've got to you know keep them real clean and be very careful with handle yeah, them very that's carefully true. yeah uh there's a lot involved with that whereas with uh you know online media or even you know your local plex library or whatever you know you just grab your smartphone you say play this and boom it's there now of course it's more compressed and that's 
you know, for, for video files, they, they want the best possible quality. Ultra HD Blu-rays are compressed as well, but not as much. Right. Well, ha I mean, video is always compressed at least to some because at least to some it's degree, right? It's just too yeah. big. Yeah, exactly, um, and especially UHD. <laughs> when they deliver movies digitally to movie theaters, those are files are massive. Massive. They have to basically ship a hard drive, a giant hard. I mean, not physically giant, but c capacity giant hard drive to the theater because they can't. You know, it's just too big. Yeah. Exactly. And they, so, use a, they and even those are compressed, not as much. Yeah, even those they are use, compressed. They use JPEG 2000, which is a yeah. uh, yeah. still a compression, but yeah. Um, yeah, but you're you're entirely right that that HDR is the most important thing, much more than the increase in number of pixels. But you, as you said, you need a TV that can do it. You need uh, an AVR, or whatever your signal chain consists of everything needs to be able to pass that along and then there's the other thing there's a guy suing uh amazon because they're using the term buying movies when in fact you aren't buying movies at amazon you're buying the right to keep them until at such time as amazon revokes that right and so <laughs> that th this is the other problem with this transition from physical to digital media ownership yeah. rights for yeah, instance, yeah, yeah. if I yeah. buy a book, I can hand it down to my kids. They may not want right. it, but I can give it to them. It's right. unclear. It's Whether really unclear hand, what happens to yeah. my Kindle books. Yeah, good question. Or and more, I think book Kindle books probably aren't as much of an issue as movies. You know, if you think you bought a movie and you want to hand that down to your kid, right. that's you probably can't. not going to happen. No, you can't. You'd have to give. Well, you can. You can give them. You, what you're handing down is the iTunes account. <laughs> Son, yeah. so one day this <laughs> password will be yours. By the way, though, uh, one thing I will correct you on is the uh, human eye only has a, a momentary, instantaneous dynamic range of about three stops. I know, but we but we dilate. Our pupils dilate, I know. Right. It's an apparent. What is the apparent uh, range? It's like? Well, the, the absolute range is, uh, I don't know, seven or eight or maybe even well, ten not even stops. That, not even that big. Okay. Maybe not even that big. It's like when you ask photographers or yeah, these guys, what's yeah. the pixel? How, what's how many megapixels does that film have? They say it's not. It's different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not the same. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what is hip. Hip is Scott Wilkinson, our home theater geek and a contributor at TechHive.com. Scott joins us each week at this time to be hip. To be cool, <laughs> to be our home theater geek. Hello, Scotty. Hey, Leo. I do like to talk about what is hip in the audio video world. Yeah. So our last call had a great. I mean, Tom was really asking important questions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's there's even more which I didn't get into. Ran out of time, but there's the digital ownership issue as well. Oh man. There's a lawsuit going on right now. Some people are m mad at Amazon saying you can't use the word bought. When I buy a digital movie from you, because it, I'm not owning it, I am only buying the rights to play it until such time as you revoke those rights or I pass away. And this is true with all digital media, music, books, mm -hmm. TV shows and movies. You don't really own those. Well, you'd have to read the fine print. Is that really true? I don't know. Yeah, no, and you own a right to them. Okay. A license right. to license to play them, and we know that because which, from which, time which specifically they can revoke it's if revocable. they want to. We know okay. that because it happens from time to time. Well, I know that Netflix, for example, takes movies off their site all the time and adds stuff. But I mean, it's stuff. But you you're bought, not buying really Netflix. True? You're buying uh, no, no, no. You're buying a subscription. A subscription. Right? I, but yeah. even if you buy a movie from iTunes or a book, we've seen, for instance, well, who was it sold a book? Uh, 1984, George Orwell's 1984. I think it was sure. on Kindle, and uh, they revoked it. It disappeared from people's Kindles because really? there was some sort of rights issue. Yes, yeah, ironic. It was 1984. <laughs> yeah, uh, really. <laughs> so, yeah, you don't. If you read the fine print, and you probably have to look pretty deep, you don't. You have a license to watch it or use it, but it's revocable. Oh man! And see who the, reads that fine print. Nobody. Those, those those things that you click on agree, I mean, they're pages long. And who reads them? Nobody. And I think it's the case, although I should probably read the fine print, that when you <laughs> buy a DVD or a UHD disc or you uh, you know, buy a physical book, 
mm -hmm. or you buy a physical uh, CD, that that's yours. You own it. Yeah, exactly. You can't transmit it. You can't give it, but you can give it to somebody. You could sell it to somebody. You can keep yep. it. You can yep. hand it down to your heirs. And that's one of the reasons I think why physical media sticks around. I, I agree with you. I don't think we're going to see much more development in physical media. We're not going to get an 8K disc, for example. I don't think we're going to get that. But uh, people like to own things. They like to have the physical thing in their hand. As we were talking offline, you know, physical media has its own problems of you've got to get the disc, you got to find it. Hopefully you've you know, you've put it on your shelf yeah, good, in a way you can find it. Good luck finding it. Not even that <laughs> finding it in the stores, you know. It's harder yeah, well, and harder. Too. Plus, yeah. aren't our and movie companies I think they're not putting everything on UHD anymore. Are they? Uh, I used don't know. Used to be about they everything. put everything on DVD. Well, true. Although and back blue, catalog right? they never did that with. Mm. But I wonder uh, is I don't think there's a UHD disc of every movie that comes out. Is there? Well, I don't know. That's a good question. I'd have to I'd have to do some research on that. Certainly the big titles, they all come out on UHD. Yeah. Um and uh over at AVS Forum where I used to work, uh, Ralph Potts, he reviews tons of UHD Blu-rays. Right. That's all he mostly all he does is re review a UHD Blu-rays. So but he wants to schlep those around and Yeah, you and stick he, them in the in the drive and you you know, it's it's much other, more of a hassle. The other issue unlike a paper book uh, these formats are going to die, maybe even you know before you do, which mm. means you might hand down these UHD discs to your, your <laughs> heirs, and they might go, thanks, Grandpa. Now what do I do? <laughs> now what do I do with it? <laughs> now what do I do? So, this is, and, and this is an advantage of, of, of digital media, aside from the fact that, that you might not be able to keep it forever, that it can be revoked, but it can be transferred from one storage device to another. Right. This is the problem that, that I've, come, I've thought about a lot in terms of, uh, I mean, who can play a floppy disk anymore? Right. Hardly anybody. But if you transferred that to a hard disk and then transferred that to another one, it's digital data. It got copied perfectly. Son, I'm leaving you my entire collection of zip disks. <laughs> I actually have some zip disks yeah. on a zip drive, but Everything's I have no, Everything's no, on them. <laughs> no computer with a SCSI port. Right. Remember SCSI <laughs> what are you going to do with it? <laughs> so in some respects, yeah, bits, bits are maybe a better storage medium, at least for long-term uh, storage. I think so. I think so. Until you can exactly. print a movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's stone tablets. Yeah, Things those have lasted. Are, yeah. They're still around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so the, you know, it's an interesting question. If, if you're talking purely in terms of quality... Mm -hmm. Physical uh, physical UHD disc is going to be the best. It's the best, absolutely, no question. And the enth for the enthusiast, that's all that matters, and and that's fine. I like watching UHD Blu-ray discs because of the quality. As long as you have a a display system and a sound system that will reproduce it as best as possible, you're you're in for the best experience you can get at home. But that's a certain kind of viewer because I, for instance. And while I have a UHD player and I've bought many UHD discs, I never rewatch those. What I really love having is an online catalog of a nearly infinite number of movies that mm -hmm. I can browse around and say, oh, I haven't seen that in years. Right. Let's watch it. And yeah, not, you wouldn't think of that as you're, as you're scanning your rows of discs. Yeah. It's not going to be that complete. And I don't really, I mean, I'm not going to go, oh, boy, it would sure be nice if I had a physical disc of this. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. The difference isn't that big, is it? No, not 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 except if you're super critical. Yeah, and most of us aren't. No, most people aren't, and so no, it's not going to be that big a difference. Of course, when the um, internet I, goes out, you might wish you had some physical. Media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I got a I got an email from uh, from our good friend John Jammer B. Uh, talking about this with regard to audio. He's and our studio he's, engineer, and he has friends who are massive audiophiles. Massive audiophiles. And he's been playing around now with the Raspberry Pi. You, you know that one, of course. Oh, yeah. Little $35 computer. And there's this company in Italy that is adapting the Raspberry Pi to very high end digital audio standards. And so he's been playing around with that. It's not very expensive. And, and I asked him by email, I said, so do you hear a difference? And he goes, well, no, not on my system, probably. It's all theoretical. And uh, not so, with our ears. 
And not with our old ears. That's right. <laughs> um, and as I as I learned in my high res audio unscientific study, you know, unless you have a system that can reproduce the higher than twenty kilohertz frequencies and the greater than ninety six dB dynamic range from CDs, then you know, having that all that extra capability isn't going to get conveyed by the system to your ears. So really it comes down to what you value. Do you value mm -hmm. convenience or quality? And yep. for me, the answer varies depending on what I'm watching. I'm really glad yes. I yes. have a, a Blu-ray. It's not mm -hmm. UHD of Barry Lyndon, uh, Stanley Kubrick's beautiful right. film, boring film, but beautiful <laughs> film. Cause that I want to see the beauty. I'm not watching that for, uh, you know, any nostalgic purpose or any entertainment purpose, but right. the beauty of the right. images, I want those as, as crystal clear as I can get. Right. But if I'm watching Zabriskie Point or some older movie, I'm really com content to stream it. And uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. most yeah, of what exactly. I watch is streamed. Even And I have to say, even then, the 4K, when I go watch it on my 4K TV, it mm -hmm. does look better. It looks good. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's, I think, as you mentioned during that call, Mo as much because of high dynamic range as anything else. Yeah. You know, because that makes... That does make a difference. It yeah. makes a big difference, much more than the number of pixels. Yeah. So, so whether you it's your right ears or your eyes, uh, yes. you're going to weigh out the difference in quality versus the difference in convenience. convenience. And, and it may yep. not even be the same answer for the same content. Some content... Correct, correct. You want to hear it perfectly and some yep. content it doesn't matter as much. Yep. Yep, exactly right. That is Scott Wilkinson, Home Theater Geek, contributor at techhive.com. Thank you for letting me elaborate a little more on that answer for Tom because I, you know, oh, sure. there's a lot oh, more to say about question. that. Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll talk next week. Thank you, Scott. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More calls right after this. All right, Scotty. It's all right. yours, my friend. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> FRAT says 320 kilobits per second or flack can't tell the difference. Well, there you go. Yeah. Um, Mike One says, uh, from what I understand, high audio sample rates can actually make the music sound worse. I don't think it has to do with the sample rate per se. It has to do with how the music was mastered. And... There are certainly examples of CDs that sound better than high-res audio tracks because of the mastering. That's the key, is how was it mastered? And EQ... There have, there have been audit articles, though, that say that when you get to a higher sample rate, you're introducing artifacts that actually reduce the quality of the sound. Well... There's there's weird artifacts. So this was a sound engineer who wrote this article. Came out some years ago. It was really I, interesting. He was quoting the Nyquist theorem, which says you don't need right. more information than a certain number of bits. And right. his his case certain was certain sample rate. Yeah, his case was uh, if you do higher than that, you're going to introduce some artifacting that you may regret. Well, you know, the the artifacting may be bad or it may be good. I mean, one reason why some people think that high sample rate sounds better is that it allows these ultrasonic art, uh, ultrasonic uh, overtones, which interact with each other and produce uh, what are called difference tones or combination tones down in the audible range. And that might sound better or it might sound worse. Uh, so that's that's an interesting question. I'd love for you to send me the that article if you can find I it. I will find it, yeah. Because uh, I would love to love I to read to, that and see, I see what this guy says. Your, calendar, your clock to do it, but I will find it for you. <laughs> it's quite. It's kind of the article that debunks the whole high res audio. Thing. Oh, I would love to read that. Yeah, I would love to read that. Hey, it's Doctor Mom, Grandma, and Mister Quest and Loquacious. Always so glad to see you guys here on these happy Saturdays. Um. Jammer B has never found Barry Lyndon boring. I was going to say that one movie I will always watch on disc is Billy Lynn. And I know some people don't like it. They don't, for one reason or another, the look of it anyway. But I really do. I love the look of it, the high dynamic range and the high frame rate. Um, 
I also happen to like the acting in the story. A lot of people don't, and I'm in the minority there from the people I've talked to. Sorry. I really like it. Yeah, I do own that on UHD. Because yeah. that's the only way really to... That's the only way to see that them. high frame rate, but... Oh, yeah, you are. Yeah, you're getting 60 anyway. Yeah. He shot it at 120, but you're getting 60 on the UHD Blu-ray, which is way more than the 24 that every other movie, almost every other movie, was was shot at. Um, another movie at a high frame rate, another Ang Lee, and as a matter of fact, more recent, called Gemini Man. I haven't bought that on UHD Blu-ray yet because the movie itself is terrible. <laughs> I saw that in the theaters, and I was just, oh, my God, this is awful. But it looks great. The 60, I mean, the, the motorcycle chase is amazing. And I'll probably buy the UHD Blu-ray just for that motorcycle chase scene at 60 frames per second, uh, which just looked phenomenal. But the story, I was just like, ho-hum, give me a break. I can do, there's so much better. So many better movies out there. Um, let's see. You, Zhufi, X-U-F-I. What about Shoutcast streams or Icecast? You know, VLC used to have Shoutcast, Icecast directories that have good sample. I don't know. I have never tried Shoutcast or Icecast. I'll have to go look that up. Um, I don't know about those. So thanks for letting me know. I will uh, check it out. There, Shoutcast was a proprietary version of MP3 streaming, and Icecast, which we use, is a open source version of MP3 streaming. Oh, okay. It's MP3. It's MP3. So it's it's lower quality than than FLAC or or Wave or lossless uh, codec. Generally, uh, but how much for live stuff, which is like yeah. what we do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because Video. it has to be low. It has, it has to be low bit stream, low bit rate. Uh, and if it, and if it's just talking, who cares? You know, it can it can sound voice can sound just fine with a low bit rate, but um, music not so much. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, eighty eight eighty eight ask. Leo, the phone number, line three, Tom. Oh, I think it did Tom in Milwaukee. Let's do uh, Johnny in Atlanta. Hello, Johnny. Hey, Leo. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Good, good. Hey, uh, uh, I've called you a, a number of times over the last few weeks because I've worked with my church as we get ready yes. to move back into the physical building. Yes. And uh, so we're not going to be back into the church until around July. And when that time comes, it's going to be very restricted. Right. Okay, so they're gonna they're gonna remove all the hymnals, they're gonna remove all the you know reading material. Yeah, you don't want to touch and anything. So, yeah. Okay. Right. So nothing to be touched. Okay. So they want to broadcast or be able to display the words to sure. the uh, the lyrics to the hymns. Yep. The words to the Bible scripture. You know, maybe notes from the minister. Probably you know using something like you know I've been looking at uh, um, what my worship or some some kind of you know software. But the challenge here that, that they're that they're looking at is w what's the best way to display that? Like, do you want to use projectors? This is a this uh, sanctuary has uh, four thousand. Let's say four thousand eight hundred twenty one square feet wow. is the uh, okay. is the sanctuary. All right. Okay, so it seats about four hundred. Uh, it's three sections of pews, and I think the furthest pew goes back. I think twelve rows, twelve thirteen rows. So actually, uh, it's not that big. Uh, you could, no, it's more of a medium to a smaller church. Yeah. But, but the, the, the person that's having me look at all this, they're saying that minimum we probably need to be looking at is probably uh, 90 inches. Uh, yeah, I think you want to go projection. You do, what, you, what you don't need to do is go with a direct view because, first of all, you're not going to get 90 inches. I have a 100-inch projector in my living room. <laughs> and uh, it's nice. You can easily get an inexpensive projector to go to hundreds of inches um, just by right. you, know, you need the, enough lumens, of course, to, so it's bright enough. But I imagine that the sanctuary isn't super bright. Well, that's not true because we have a number of beautiful uh, stained glass windows. Oh, so light brightness in. is yeah. a problem. All right. Especially as, you know, sometimes the service is running around noon, right? And uh, sometimes that's peak time yeah, for the sure, sun that's peeking sure. through some of the, uh, for the windows. So brightness is an issue. And plus, 
we're going to be limited to the number of people that can come in the sanctuary. So there's probably going to be, you know, gonna a few s- more services. spread out too. Yeah. Right. Through the day. So, so there'll for sure be people the at the farthest uh, possible distance. How far would you yeah. say that is? Uh, I have no idea. I have no idea what the farthest distance well, is. Well, if you have fir- uh, 14 have- rows, uh, and let's say there's what, I don't know, four or five feet between the rows, the farthest people are, probably aren't more than 100 feet away from the right, screen yeah let's just that's right. very yeah. ballpark you know what let me get scott wilkinson in on this because he's still here hi scott <laughs> hey and, leo and boy i'm glad you called me up here because this uh, seems like I've something some- up your alley well yeah check this out um i was as as your caller was talking i i went to projectorcentral.com which i'm actually starting to write about i'll be telling you about that in the next week or two but right at the top of the home page boom Church Projector Buyer's Guide. Wow. Cool. What? That is so cool. It's almost I... as if it was meant to be. <laughs> hey, can I ask this question? When you're doing this and you've got two projectors, I mean, two screens, does that mean you have to have two projectors? Like if you're yeah. using a software, say, like yeah, Easy yeah, Worship. Yeah. Each, screen, gotta... each screen needs a projector. You yep, don't, you don't need so. two sources, but you need two projectors. Right. Okay, okay, okay. so you need one laptop. Split split to two different. It's like have a laptop with two monitors. Okay, so you have a laptop with two monitors, and so like you, I, again, I'm looking at different software, and so I'm, I guess something like Easy Worship. I don't know if you're familiar with that, Leo. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the software at all. So uh, you know, I think a lot of churches use PowerPoint. Believe it or not, to show the <laughs> to show the uh, I don't want to say lyrics to show the words of the hymns. Are they lyrics? I guess they are. Uh, the words yeah, they're of the sort hymns. of lyrics. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that makes it sound like it's a rock opera or something. But uh, <laughs> um, I think you could even use PowerPoint. But yeah, if there's software, specialized software for it, that's nice too. You could use teleprompter software. Really, um, that's what you're doing is pretty simple. You're you're putting words up on a screen and scrolling through them as as the uh, song and, progresses. And so the, the biggest cost, I guess, with this, if, let's just say you say Windows, because right for the laptop, because it would be cheaper than a Mac, yeah. would be the projectors, right? You want to put the money into the projectors themselves? Yeah, well, that's if you want them to be visi- uh, visible, yes. Yeah, they need to be pretty bright. They, uh, You know, in, a, in that kind of a setting, they need to be pretty bright. Okay. And one of the okay, well, one great. of the section one of the sections in this buyer's guide is how many lumens do you need? Yeah. And so, if, so it, that, if it, it, they, you'll say how far back people are, how bright it is in the church, and they'll yep. tell you what you need. They'll they'll how big the screen needs to be, and and all of that. And yeah, I have to say, Easy Worship. I'm looking at the website. Uh, looks pretty cool. It's basically a PowerPoint program for worship services. Mm, correct. Yeah. And it's and it's one of the cheaper ones. I think it's like fifteen dollars a month. Oh, that's great. Or, yeah. or maybe 20 for a church our size uh, would be $20 a month for running through one laptop. Okay, but you're saying use that one laptop to connect to two projectors. Yeah. Right. Like Firing onto two different screens. And the screens you get are important, too. I, I would really look at what are called ambient light rejecting or ALR screens, which uh, help the projector, help the image come be very visible in a high ambient light environment, such as... A sanctuary at noon. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. This is some really good information. I, I was given this task this week, and this is all new to me. Yeah. Uh, mm, so yeah. I, and I and I don't even have all the budget money yet that's going to be used. But the, the good news—they were, they were thinking TV. They were say look at TVs, but no, 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 no. Really expensive. A, ni- a right? ninety and inch, a ninety inch TV is or ninety eight inch TV is going to be tens of thousands of yeah, dollars. Yeah. <laughs> the biggest reasonably cost TV will be seventy inches, and even that's going to be thousands. And if you need two of them, I I think projector projector is easily the best way to go on that. Yep. Yep. I agree. When you want a big screen. And, well, I appreciate that. Now, Leo, I'm still waiting. Uh, anxiously for your ask the tech guy about live stream and i just i watched your one oh, man. About zoom versus uh, jitsi yeah uh, so live uh, streaming is uh, challenging because uh i <laughs> i feel a lot of pressure i've been building my studio at home uh the problem is that uh when we first set up the podcast network twit which i uh, is my business for f- last 15 years this week in tech uh, we gradually got to the point where we we're using pretty close to professional gear, the kind of gear a, a mega church might use with a TriCaster switcher. And we use digital audio from Telos. Uh, we use some really good stuff. And I'm certainly not going to want to tell people how you could spend millions to do it. But what's interesting is over the years, 
the stuff that I've used and spent so much money on has gotten, as always, cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. You know, we thought, oh, man, this is great. We can do what I used to do in TV, on tech TV, <clears throat> for a tenth the cost. Well, you now can do what I did at Twit for a hundredth of the cost. And uh, so I'll show what I consider the current uh, state of the art for um, video switching. It's not going to be tens of dollars but it'll be under a thousand dollars, and so I think there there are some things you can really do that are, are quite nice. Yeah, I just want to make sure I do a good job of that. I'm, you know, the pressure okay. is, the, and, uh, the pressure is on Johnny. <laughs> I appreciate, and I just want to say a word out to any of your sponsors that are listening. Leo, I've listened to you uh, for about three years now, and I've and I've and I've bought a number of products based on your recommendation recommendation based on being sponsors, and been very happy. Thank you. Majority of them. Thank you. And even after they, you know, I know you've had some pulling out advertising dollars because of this situation. Because of COVID, yeah. Uh, but 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 yeah, but they 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 stay on your mind. And just for instance, um, I wanted to kind of start up a uh, a quick server the other day because I wanted to play around with creating my own Jitsi server, but I didn't want to do it. Um, on, on any of my machines here, and I just thought, well, I'll just let, let somebody host it. So I used DigitalOcean for thank the first you. time. Yeah, you know? and only you. because, like I said, I've, I've heard you promote them a lot, and I don't, I, I didn't see them on your page because I would have clicked the link there from your page to make sure you got the credit for that. But yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> advertisers come and go, but their impression lasts a lifetime. Advertisers remember that. Yeah, remember that. Uh, if, if, if you listen to somebody's recommendation, and the only way, only place you got me, Leo, we've talked about this, kiddingly, is Alcam. <laughs> All right. Hey, I got to go because we got to do some advertisements. Johnny, good to talk okay. to you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Scotty, it's your turn once again. I'm still looking for that article. If I find it, I'll tell you. I, I just just uh, shoot it over to me. I appreciate it. Indeed, I will. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget to put that clock up. That helps me. Anyway, hey, everybody. So good to see you all. Uh, Phoenix Warp 1 uh, asked an interesting question in the chat room. So how does 4K work with animation? Most cameras are made to shoot 4K or HD or whatever. That's true. 4K, 4K these different the, these days. But how can animated movies be upgraded to 4K? Akira, for example, started out as DVD. But how does that translate upwards to 4K? Well, this is always a, this is a great question. First of all, most animation, or at least computer-generated imagery, CGI, that's that's used in movies, is not 4K. It's generated at 2K. And the reason is uh, processing power and time. Uh, doing animation, rendering animation at 4K takes four times as long as at 2K. And in the movie business, time is money. So they... They tend not to do animation at 4K. I don't know uh, about anime or, or certain or strictly animated movies like the Pixar movies and so on. I, I honestly don't know whether they start or end up as 4K native files or not. I tend to doubt it, but I'm not sure. Uh, the good news is that a lot of animation can be upscaled pretty well, pretty easily, unlike you know, pho pho photographic uh, imagery. So uh, I think Akira, for example, can probably be upscaled pretty well because the level of detail and the um, gradations, uh, subtle gradations of color, aren't as pronounced in most animation. And so you can more easily and effectively predict if you have one pixel and it needs to become four pixels. It looks like, I'm looking at Akira, it looks like Akira, it's so old, 1988, that it was not even CGI in the beginning with. It was probably cell animation. Ah, And okay. so you just take well, higher resolution a, pictures you just of take, it. Exactly, you just hire, yes. If it was cell animation, that's one thing. Sure, you can just uh, scan it, uh, put it through a film scanner at a higher resolution, and boom, you're done. Um, but if it started out in a computer... It probably didn't start out at 4K. Um, but upscaling it is easier than upscaling 
photographic images. So and in some cases, you might have the models, you might have it all, and you could re-render it at a higher resolution with higher and that's res textures. I think that's particularly true of video games. Yeah. Because yeah. video games are based on models and vector ray vector vector ray analysis and uh, triangles and and so on. So sure, th those are algorithmic, and we're going to start seeing 8K video games before too long. The right. Sony PlayStation Five can do 8K video games, and we're that we're going to see them there. So I count video games as a slightly different uh, animal than uh, animated movies. Uh, <clears throat> But anyway, yeah, so it, it's a very interesting question. Um, let's see, Maverick 56. Uh, whoops, I hate it when the, the scrolls. Uh, it sure, uh, it, hmm, if you play video games, but in case you know the answer, is there a big difference in playing video games in 4K as opposed to HD? My PS4 is the first that came out so that it's not 4K, but wondering if you, if you can tell the difference. Um, in a case of a video game, you probably can, and that has to do with motion detail, right? So video games have a lot of motion in them or else they're boring, right? I guess I'm not a video gamer, so I don't really know, but I'm going to assume that video games have a lot of motion, they're action, right? So when there's a lot of motion, uh, it's possible that higher pixel count will give you better resolution although that has more to do with frame rate and refresh rate than with with uh, physical resolution with spatial resolution there's two types of resolution there's spatial resolution which is you know 1920 by 1080 or 3480 by 2160 or whatever the spatial resolution is then there's temporal resolution which is the resolution as you move things around, either as things move in the frame or as the camera, quote unquote, pans or moves around. So uh, I'm, I'm now taking it back when I say that a 4K will look better be in motion resolution. It won't necessarily because that depends on temporal resolution and that depends on frame rate and a, and a couple of other factors. But in any, in any event, um, uh it, it may or may not look better. It all depends on the processor, really, and the speed, the frame rate that the game is re being rendered at. And PlayStation 4 has a faster processor than PlayStation 3. PlayStation 5 has a faster processor than PlayStation 4. So, you know, the faster the processor, the more frames it can render per second and the better the motion blur will be. And that is how I respond to that. Um, oh, Loquacious, it's always so good to see you too. As I said to Loquacious in the uh, chat room, she and I are both uh, uh, Ren Fair rats, and uh, I miss the Ren Fair this year. It's obviously been canceled, and I'm, I'm bummed not to be able to go with my wife and hoist a, hoist a glass, ho hoist a mug, a tankard of ale, and say, huzzah! Uh, Beatmaster uh, agrees with Leo. Akira was uh, released in theater, so there's a negative on film. Uh, true, but what was it? What was it rendered at? I, if it was a cell animation, then yeah, as we as we said, no problem at all. Uh, Doctor Bomb Grandma says, uh, uh, Team uh, uh, Ghibli, the collection including Spirited Away, is now available to stream. Well, that's cool. Um, I, I did enjoy Spirited Away, uh, Howl's Moving Castle. Was that Ghibli? I don't remember. Um, and there was another one more recently, and now my brain is not quite remembering it. Um, there's Ghost in the Shell, of course, but that was the most recent one was a live action with Scarlett Johansson, um, which was, an, which was okay. The, the graphics were beautiful. Uh, the, the visuals of that movie were really, really nice. <clears throat> so that is uh, how I think about that. Uh, so Phoenix, I answered your question, I think. Let's see here. Uh, oh, Retro G, could, could I recommend a replacement TV remote that has a headphone jack for private listening? Ooh, that's a really good question. I know that the Roku remote has a headphone jack. So if you're watching Roku... Um, 
then that's great. I don't know of any universal remotes that just play the, the audio from the TV no matter what it's playing, whether it be a cable box or a Roku or whatever. It would have to basically, the TV would have to somehow beam the audio to the remote, I would guess by Bluetooth. I'll have to look into that. Thank you, Scott. My pleasure. Take care. See you next week. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, you know, all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Larry. Petaluma. Hello, Larry. Hey, Leo. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you? I'm doing okay. okay. I'm uh, staying alive, as uh, John DeVolta would say. Yeah, we're lucky. We we both are, are in Petaluma, California, Northern California, and it's beautiful up here. The weather's great. We're not having an Arctic vortex, and, uh, and uh, the sun is out, and the birds are singing, and you almost think everything's normal. It, it it tends to seem that way, but it's definitely not normal. No, it's not. It's the new, it's the new normal. The new normal, exactly. What can I do for you today? I'm calling because I've got an old um, uh, fluorescent backlit TV. Uh, it's a Samsung. It's about 12 years old. Yeah. And considering how much uh, uh, screen time I'm spending, I'm thinking about upgrading it to 4K. Um it's in a surround sound system connected to a Denon um, receiver, which is not 4K, as right. far as I know. Right. And I don't want to have to upgrade both of them at the same time, considering um, the financial impact I might have. Um, <laughs> I, I, and I know you've said oftentimes you have to do the whole chain. Yeah, the, the so-called upgrade cascade. It yeah. begins, you get a new TV, and then you realize, oh... <laughs> I need to get everything else new. So do you drive the, do you use the Denon as an AV receiver? Do you put some other video sources into it and then that goes to the TV or is everything directly connected to the TV? You just use no, the Denon I use for it, sound. It's a surround sound. It's a 5.1 surround sound system. Then that won't change. Whatever. That won't change. So the good news is you're feeding the Denon from the TV. Yes. Yeah. Using the uh, audio re return channel, ARC, or do you use the optical out? How do you do that? I'm using uh, 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 HDMI cables. Okay. Probably when you get your new TV, you'll use the optical out. Then that's the same. Uh, that doesn't matter whether you're on 4K or, or uh, HD, the same audio. Uh, so I wouldn't, that's not going to change it. The reason I had to upgrade is because I was doing a lot of streaming and the streaming stuff was coordinated by the AV receiver, the Denon AV receiver. So I had my ultra my Roku ultra plugged into that. I had to buy, first of all, I had to buy a Roku ultra because I, if you well, want 4k streaming, you mentioned, I, I just did buy a Roku ultra oh, good. Uh, good. On, about a week ago. That's 4K. And, but the old one was getting a little funky, and it works fine with the with the, sure. with, the with the HDMI. Ah, but you um, won't get 4K if you're putting the Ultra through the Denon. The Denon's not going to pass a 4K signal. Okay, because I I and I was curious, so I actually I actually contacted, I emailed Denon's customer service, asking them if I could do this, and they said I shouldn't have a problem with the 4K, yeah. which conflicted with, with with what I've heard you say. You That's won't have a problem with it. You just won't get 4K. You'll get oh, 1080p. There won't be a problem. Okay. <laughs> you okay. just won't get. It'll down. Yeah. It'll downgrade. What you'll want to do okay. with the ultra is plug it directly into the TV. Okay, I got it. All right. So and so later. So I can still get. I can still get signal. It'll just be. It'll just be downscaled. And then when I want to upgrade the receiver, then I can get the full 4K. Yeah, you can test this uh, theory when you uh, plug in your Denon. If you switch to a video input from the Denon and look at your TV, your TV will say, ah, I see a 1080p signal. And your TV will play the 1080p signal. Regardless okay. of what's going into the Denon, it's never going to output more than a 1080p signal because it's not a, it's a high, it might not even do that if it's not a high def AV receiver, but if it is, that's the best you're going to get. You're not going to get 4K out of it. It doesn't pass, in other words, it doesn't pass it through. 
Yeah, I got it. How much content on TV is actually 4K anyway? Is, there's not much. Not yet. on TV at all. But on the Roku. Uh, on the Roku, quite a bit. Net, much of Netflix's new stuff is 4K. Uh, Amazon Prime is shooting in 4K. Um, if you are buying movies from Apple or Vudu or uh, Google or Amazon, much of that will be 4K. And more importantly, the 4K HDR. That really does make a difference. Okay. So, so, All right. so I so I could buy the TV now and then and 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 just run the Roku directly to the TV to get 4K. Yeah, that's what I would do. I would not pass it through the Denon because the Denon won't pass the 4K information along. It'll it'll what what happens all the way down the chain is uh, the uh, the Roku will say Denon, what do you speak? And the Denon will say I speak uh, these things, including 1080p. And it'll say fine, here's a 1080p signal. And the Denon will say to the TV, what do you speak? And the TV will say, well, I speak 4K, but I also speak 1080p. And the Denon will say, well, I speak 1080p. And they'll so the whole chain will end up being the best the Denon can do. But if you okay. directly connect it to the 4K TV. The 4K TV will say to the Roku Ultra, what do you speak? It'll say 4K. Good. Let's do it. And then how do I get the surround sound uh, system? The how TV. The so the TV is coming. You feed the TV audio, which will have an optical out available to it. You could use the ARC as well, but I would use the optical out and feed okay. that into the Denon. And the Denon uh, T will see, and then you, you'll have a setting, I think, on the Denon. If not, you can use the HDMI. But there'll be a setting that says, okay, yeah, TV sound. And that TV sound will be seven one or five one, and uh, you'll be able to play it. Great. Okay. Wonderful. Now, All right, thank you. I, I thank have you to. Your help you're very welcome. I have to uh, acknowledge Mike Heiss, who is an expert on this in the chat room. Who says my Marantz AVR all pass 4K through. So your Marantz AV receiver is not a 4K receiver, Mike. He's in our chat room, so this is going to take a while. So. I would, you know, what you want to do is, and you can easily verify this, take that Denon, plug it into your uh, um, 4K, your new 4K TV, plug a 4K device into the Denon, and see what the TV's seeing. My experience has been, and I guess this might depend on the device, on the AV receiver you're using, the TV will go, yeah, thanks for 1080p60. That's great. I appreciate it. You have to check to see whether it passes through. I it doesn't seem like most AV receivers are not. Well, maybe they are. Just passing passing it along. <laughs> okay, sure, whatever. Um, Mike says anything with HDMI 2.0 HDCP, which is most current products, will do 4K. Maybe that's the issue. Current. <laughs> So, yeah, you, I would say just try it, see what you get. HDCP is another issue. That's the content protection, the copy protection. And that also can throw things off because, uh, as you know, Hollywood is terrified that you are a pirate. 8888-ASK-LEO, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Your questions continue. So we're working from home. We're traveling out and about. We are at more risk than ever because the bad guys come out. They see uh, they see COVID nineteen. They see quarantine as a disaster tunity, an, an opportunity for them in disaster. That's why you need Express VPN, a VPN, a virtual private network. This is the one I use. And by the way, there are a lot of choices out there. It took me some time to really figure out which the best one was. It's clear, not just, by the way, me, but almost every site recommends ExpressVPN as the best on the market. And I'll tell you the most important reasons from my point of view. You use a VPN for security and use it for privacy. Let me talk about privacy. ExpressVPN, see, the problem with privacy, if you use ExpressVPN so that your mobile carrier or your home internet service provider doesn't know what you're doing online, doesn't log and sell it to marketers and all that stuff. If you're using it for that reason, you have to understand that you're really just kicking the can down the road. This problem no longer now is it my home ISP or my carrier. It's the VPN service provider. Those 
people now know everything I do. They're in effect, they become by proxy your internet service provider. So if they were to be bad guys, they could monitor what you're doing. In fact, if you get a cheap or free VPN, chances are it's exactly how they're monetizing it. By, by selling your information. The, th the thing I love about ExpressVPN, not only do they not log, but they stand so, they're so strong about this, so adamant, they actually created a technology called Trusted Server. When you log into ExpressVPN, the server that you're logging into spins up your own version, your own unique trusted server. You operate through that the whole time. And then when you hang up, it spins it down. And Trusted Server is created in such a way that it's sandboxed. It cannot write to the disk. You live only in memory. And when you're gone, you're gone. All the information about your visit is gone. It cannot be saved to disk. And ExpressVPN uh, actually had a third-party audit of this Trusted Server that verified that that's exactly how it works. So that's one. Number two, uh, security. The whole idea of, an exp of a VPN of any kind is that when you're at a coffee shop, an open access point, even at home, no one can tell what you're doing except the service provider where you emerge into the public Internet. Again, that's why you got to choose a good one. A lot of times people don't use a VPN unless they absolutely have to because they're oh, it's so slow. It slows me down. Not Express VPN. This is the other reason I love it. I've never seen a faster, and maybe it has to do with trusted server. I'm not sure. I've never seen a faster VPN. I know one thing that makes it fast. They have uh, servers in nearly 100 countries. So that means you're almost always using one that's very fast nearby. I always use a San Francisco one. So that really cuts down on the hops, makes it a lot faster. Um, fast enough, though, that here's an interesting thing. No lag. You can stream HD videos, no buffering. And that brings up another reason you might like ExpressVPN, because you can log into other countries. You can be, you can appear to emerge on the internet in, in uh, England. So let's say you want to watch Doctor Who. You've got a Netflix subscription. It's not on Netflix US. It is on Netflix UK. So you fire up Netflix, fire up ExpressVPN, say, I want to be in London. Suddenly you're in the UK. You refresh your Netflix, and there's Doctor Who. Works in Japan with anime. There's a lot of great anime. That's really clever. One button click. You can set up your grandparents with it. You can set up your family members who are not sophisticated. You just put ExpressVPN on their phone, their tablet, their laptop, even their TV, their smart device. And they one button click, they're secure. That's really important. Wired, CNET, The Verge. Everybody says ExpressVPN is number one. For those reasons, it is the best. And, you know, there have been cases where the police have come, seized ExpressVPN servers, and there's nothing on them. We know that's the case. It, it really does it. So that's another kind of audit, isn't it? Protect yourself with the VPN I use and trust. ExpressVPN.com slash tech guy. You'll get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free in a one-year package. It's really interesting. I think... Because we're all kind of trying to stay safe these days and because we're doing a lot of stuff at home, ExpressVPN has suddenly exploded in popularity. Maybe it's because I keep telling everybody about it. I don't know. I'll take a little credit. It's really good. ExpressVPN.com slash tech guy. If you hear other people say it, oh, yeah, Leo was talking about that. Just use our address, if you will. ExpressVPN.com slash tech guy. We thank ExpressVPN for supporting us during this crisis, for making a great product, and we thank you for using that address and letting them know you heard it here. ExpressVPN.com slash tech guy. The great Richard Penniman. Little Richard. He will... Be missed, but I think you're going to see a lot about him over the next week. The man who really invented rock and roll and taught Paul McCartney how to go, whoa! <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy, RIP, little Richard. Uh, 8888 Ask Leo, the phone number. Joey on the line from San Diego. Hi, Joey. Hey, Leo. Hey. How are you doing, pal? I'm well. How are you? Oh, always happy to talk to you, man. I look forward to it. Thanks for calling. What can I do for you? Leo, I guess you kind of talked about the one question I had because I was going to ask you. I I guess I'm older like you, and I listen to that Apple format. I love music, so the AAC format. I would just kind of wanted your opinion on, you know, I I listen to it and I just enjoy it. It sounds you know, good. I, yeah. 
So it's an in the whole story is kind of interesting. You mind if can I tell you a story, Joey? <laughs> Only you and I all know. Put, put, put your head back, relax, put your feet up, and I'm going to tell you a little tale. A little tale of audio compression. It all goes back to a, a German company called Fraunhofer. The Fraunhofer scientists noticed an interesting feature in human hearing. It's actually been known for some time. When you are hearing one frequency or a frequency, audio at related harmonic frequencies, but not the same, are disappear. So what they observed was, look, if you're listening to music and you're hearing a particular sound, it means that related sounds on other harmonics, you're not hearing them. Your ear doesn't hear them. We could take them out. And this was a huge revelation to them because if they could take that data out, they could shrink the file. And so that was the premise behind MP3 audio. Was I can I ask you a quick question, Leo, sure. to explain that? Yeah. You did a good job explaining that. And you always hear that. But those frequencies that they're taking out are very important because although you can't hear them, your body responds. I think so. And I think that it's also an imperfect science. So I think you're exactly right. When you're listening to MP3s, if you are taught what to listen to or somebody says, listen now, listen to this, listen to that, you can sort, you can tell. The quality is not the same. And that's what the Fraunhofer science... You don't respond to it. You're not... Yeah, you're not, you're, there's not no emotional. I agree. I agree, it's Joey. Nothing. And there's even, there's even audio artifacts. And one way that they can kind of make an mp3 sound better is by increasing the bit rate so uh, mp3 normal mp3s the ones you most often hear the ones you buy from uh music companies and stuff are stereo 64 kilobit per channel so each the left channel has 64 thousand bits per second of sampling and the right channel is 64,000 bits together it's 128 kilobits per second that's the don't, my, don't apple claim 256 well, wait a minute stop because i'm not done yet the story has just begun my friend <laughs> so so 128 that was the standard for a long time and a lot of people felt you can't tell the difference you can if you're taught what to look for you can i had a dolby scientist uh, bring me into the Dolby Labs in San Francisco. I was walking by. He said, hey, Leo, psst, come here. And literally, psst, come here. Listen. And he played an A-B comparison. And if you know what to listen for, you can tell the difference. But you can you can make that less apparent by increasing the bit rate. 128, not enough. Let's make it, as you said, 256 or even 320,000 bits per second. And by slowly increasing the bit rate, there are other things they can do, something called variable bit rate, where, where they sense it's more complex music, they use more bits to represent it. All of that can improve it. But the same thing is still happening. It's what we call lossy compression. They're taking bits of the sound out, bits that psychoacoustically you don't hear or you theoretically don't hear, but they're still removing bits of the music. That's how the compression works. The Fraunhofer guys came back to the table some years later, said the, the technology has improved. We can do a better job. And they made AAC. That's the one Apple uses. That's the sec that is a successor to MP3. And in theory, a little bit better. Mostly what they were able to do a is say, better. yeah, well, <clears throat> it's the same thing, though. They're still removing. No to me, but okay. Yeah, it sounds better, right? They got better. They're still taking chunks of the music out. But the main advantage of AAC was we can, at 128 or 160 kilobits per second, we can give you much better quality. Apple decided to release all of its music, all the iTunes music, on 256 kilobits per second. AAC, and they felt this is as good as it needs to be, almost CD quality. But remember, a CD is not recorded with a lossy compression te technique. There is no loss of the audio. The CD has everything. So Apple also offers a way of recording digitizing CDs called Apple Lossless. This is an AAC. It's not MP3. They're not taking any chunks out. They're compressing it without losing any data. In fact, if you take an Apple Lossless file and burn it to a CD, it will be bit for bit identical to the original CD. So, can that play on a, like, your I iTunes can play Apple Lossless. There's a very, maybe a more popular open version of that called FLAC. 
F-L-A-C. But both of them are really similar because it's the same bit content, ultimately. Leo, okay, can you buy this music on the Apple Tune, like the, the Lossly? The no, they don't sell Lossless. No, they don't sell Lossless. I don't think they sell Lossless. I think they only sell AAC. They don't even mention, by the way, they don't even want you to have to think about this. But there are plenty of, so they don't mention what our bit rate is and all that stuff, unless you look deep within it. There are plenty of places you can buy music that is recorded uh, either at a higher bit rate and then distributed at, uh, if using FLAC or Apple Lossless. iTracks.com is one, I-T-R-A-X.com. They call it high definition music. They make new music and they record it with higher quality equipment using 24-bit sampling. Uh, there are many, but there are, that's just one. There are many. Uh, you know what, Leo? Yeah. The, the jury's out on those guys, though. Cause they, well, the jury know, is out. They, um, claim, they claim that they do that, like you said, but a lot of times they don't. The, uh, yeah. Well, iTrax yeah. doesn't does everything right because these are new recordings. AIX also new recordings. But there are companies like HDTracks.com. That's the one you're thinking of where they got caught uh, releasing upsampled versions of lower quality recordings, which means there's no additional information in there. So you do want to be careful. And by the way, if you're buying something that was recorded pre-digital era, pre-1996, if you're buying my one of my favorite albums, Miles Davis, Kind of Blue, that was recorded on reel-to-reel -reel tape. There's no high resolution anything in that. You know, there's no point in buying anything better than CD quality of that because that information wasn't recorded. It was put on a reel-to-reel -reel tape. So it's silly to think of high bitrate music unless it's modern music and recorded digitally. And even then, you only want to buy the bitrate that was recorded at and nothing better because that's the best co co copy of that. Anyway, I think most important to understand in all of this is that MP3 and AAC are lossy. They take chunks of the music out. Um, but you don't have to worry about that because uh, you, your ear probably can't hear it, especially at a higher bit rate. If you, if you are concerned about that, CD quality is probably as good as you, your ear can hear. There's some still debate about that. And anything that's recorded losslessly using uh, Apple lossless or FLAC from CD quality is completely the same quality and sounds very, very good. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. He's been everywhere, man. He's breathing the mountain air, man. He ain't going nowhere, man, because he's Johnny Jet, our travel guy. Grounded. That should be that should be the name of your biography. Grounded <laughs> during the COVID crisis. Hey, Johnny Jet. How's your spirit? How you doing? Speaking of grounded, I just tweeted and actually put in the chat room a link to a blog about grounded planes. And you got to check out some of these photos. They're I've seen insane. them. Oh, my God. Just lined up on the runway. Tip, I mean, wing tip to wingtip. I mean, the JetBlue one is just mind boggling. And so this guy, Andy's blog, he's got a good blog and he takes photos from helicopters and actually oh i was wondering I where he got these sick. yeah so they're so they're aerial they're all aerial yeah and my buddy sam chewy who is who i think part of this whole helicopter um photography from from helicopters uh, not planes, drones, aviation not, not quite started it all huh? actually i interviewed him this week for my uh youtube channel mm -hmm. You know, if you want to check out these planes, these images of planes being grounded all across the country, most of the planes are in parked in the desert, um, Victorville in California, in New Mexico, also in Arizona. But some of these photos here are like in Pittsburgh, and um, it's it's quite, it's I mean, it's really surreal when you see it. There's so many planes on the ground right now, but travel is picking up a little bit. I um, just looked at the TSA woman we talked about last week who tweets it out. 215,000 people went through um, TSA all across the country yesterday. But keep in mind, it's usually about 2.6 million. And JFK alone will do 100,000 in a day normally. But it's slowly picking up. I still do not think it's a good time to travel. I will not get on a plane um, until they have a vaccine or, or you know, it's proven that, you know, the antibodies work and things like that, even though I've not gotten it. But I don't know. How about you? 
Yeah, we uh, well, we were just debating whether the test I got was worth anything. <laughs> but uh, I'm negative. My son's negative. My wife's negative, uh, according to the Quest Diagnostics Labs. But I think there's some question about, A, how uh, many false negatives they get, and B, more importantly, what the heck you're going to do with it anyway. Do we know that that makes right. you immune? We don't. Right. I'm going to turn my video off, by the way, to hopefully save some bandwidth. Because yeah, it's helps. radio, so I don't think it matters. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so who wants to see my face anyway? Everyone says I have a face for radio. That Jet Blue picture um, is amazing. Go to uh, Johnny's site; it's really uh, incredible. Or and I, and I tweeted blog. it. Yeah, yeah, and also, so if you want to travel virtually this week, I just also uh, put in the chat room and tweeted a link to um, Paris's Louvre Museum. So you can go on a virtual tour. I don't know if you've seen this yet, but you can go step by step it's, uh, through the museum. I've so done those bored, before. It's not as much fun as going to Paris, oh. having a little lunch in the cafe, going to see the Louvre, waiting in yeah, line with a bunch of people, <laughs> having the taxi drivers look funny at you, then having a nice cup of coffee afterwards. There's just nothing to nothing to beat that, I have to say. That's why okay, I travel, well, not just for the sights. You understand? But listen, I understand, but there are some people who cannot travel and right? not only no, just I can't. Times. I can't either. Oh, just in general, yeah. Just in general. So yeah. I mean, you know, if they've always wondered what it looked like in the Louvre, I think. Um, oh, it's better this, than nothing. This is your yes. this is your best yes chance of looking at it. But I just I'd visiting. hate for people to think that travel is about going to the Louvre. No, it's not. Obviously not. It's about meeting people, trying the food, experiencing different things, yeah. cultures, especially. Um, and that's the main thing when you travel. Yeah. I mean, yeah. before I started traveling internationally, and I didn't, I didn't get on a plane internationally until I was 23 years old. I was afraid to travel internationally. Main reasons because of fear. I, 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 you know, I didn't know how I would, if I'd be able to breathe there in other countries because I had asthma. I didn't know. Can if, I, you know, can I tell you a little secret? Sure. To this day, when I'm planning a trip, it's, I, I get scared. I'm nervous. What if I don't speak the language? What if I get there and I can't get any money? What's going to happen? And you just, that fear is normal. It's part of the adventure. And you just go, okay, I'm going to make it. It's going to be fine. Uh, there's always the American embassy if I get in trouble. And you just go. And it always, always turns out amazing. Sometimes you have adventures, but that's the point. Right? For we, sure. We're traveling for, for the adventure. Hey, when I, before I left the country, I didn't, you know, I thought I'd be unsafe in other countries. I actually feel safer in other countries than I do in America. Just, to, I mean, and that's got nothing to do with political. This is no matter who was president. Um, so, you know, you go out to these other places, you're like, wow, you know, it's, it's, it's safer for the most part. And actually, I think U.S. is ranked like number 43 in the country, but even in the world. Even that's, that's kind of unimportant. Uh, yeah, there's some risk. That's There's risk going out the door. There's risk in life. Uh, but that shouldn't let you stop you from traveling. No, and, you know, the, and hard, today, the hardest thing is the technology. language issue. And now technology and, frankly, the fact that most people speak English, that's not the issue it was. In fact, in some ways, I feel like travel is less fun because it's less different than it used to be. The, the language barrier isn't so bad. Uh, in right, some ways, money. it's easier. To, the money, it's so much easier. Remember, you used to have to go to the American Express office, get traveler's checks, countersign yeah. them all, and then bring them to, the, to, to Europe and then hope they take American Express and all of that stuff. Now you just go to an ATM machine they say you need some euros yeah yeah i need some euros and you're done it's easy my last trip to london i did not take out money from the atm right. actually right. i rarely ever take it. money out hey, i just use cards. my yeah. iphone i just use my iphone oh yeah that's now, all i do it is important if you're going to do that to use a credit card that doesn't charge you exorbitant fees for international use right exactly make sure you do make sure you get a credit card that does not have foreign transaction fees I always carry multiple ones. You know, I, American Express that isn't always accepted. Although I've been to places where they only accept, accepted that card. Usually, Visa, Mastercard, you're good to go. And the big trick, by the way, when you're going to London and other international places, when they when they do scan your uh, credit card or your phone, and they say, "Oh, you're uh, you're American. Would you like to pay in U.S. dollars?" Never pay in U.S. dollars because they're taking a percentage. Always say, "I want to pay in local currency." Right. 
Right. And that drives me nuts when I'm traveling internationally and they try and scam me like that. It's so much fun to have the local currency. They're all different colors and have pretty pictures on them. <laughs> the French money has naked women on it. It's so much fun. <laughs> now, when they can come up with a way, okay, I can go to the Louvre virtually. But when they can come up with a way for me to have Bertillon ice cream from Ile Saint-Louis in Paris virtually... Then maybe I'll consider not traveling. Until then, I can't wait to get back. I just can't wait. I know it's going to be a while, but we're going to hang in there. We're it's going to be a while, and I, and, and I do think cash is going to go away. I think most people are going to use yeah. credit cards. And this, will, this will hasten that, won't it? With, for sure. I mean, I've already was doing it way before that, yeah. and I think others are too. You know, it is this, a little sad, a little bittersweet for me because it, it was 12 days from today that we were going to get on an airplane and fly to Budapest and then get on a riverboat and go to Munich, and we were going to see the Oberammergau uh, Festival uh, in Germany uh, right about this time. And so it's a little sad, a little bittersweet. But for sure. I was supposed to be calling in from uh, New Orleans right now for a travel conference and yeah, then flying to Toronto. Yeah. That's all right. We're going to get on the road again, everybody. And uh, it's going to be fun. I'm, you know, I, I, I look forward to getting on a cruise ship again. I like cruise ships, and I hope that... Uh, well, that, Carnival announced this week that they're going to start. I'm not getting on August it this 1st. year. <laughs> they, they announced August 1st, which I do not think is going to happen. That's nuts. The CDC is going to put a hammer on it. But yeah. I, well, it's not even that. $28 a night cabins. I know. You can open it up, but you're going to see a lot of people say, well, yeah, nice, but I'm not going. Even at 20 bucks a night. is it, I mean, that's. It's There's too, still people signing up for it. Are they? Remarkable. Yeah. Remarkable. Hey, if I, I knew I were, if I knew I were immune, I might too, but who knows, right? No. Johnnyjet.com. That's his website. He's at Johnny Jet on the Twitter. He's on Instagram too. And uh, he's definitely the guy to follow if you love travel. And YouTube. And YouTube. <laughs> oh, he's got a great 39 questions segment. I love it. I'm on it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Actually, I, it's going to be fun to go on cruises soon because nobody will be on them, they'll be empty. I don't think so. Although Shanghai, I, actually, we could have brought up Shanghai Disney. They announced that That's they're opening on May 10th, I think, and only at thir they sold out in three minutes, but they're only doing 30% of the capacity, which would be, you know, much better experience. The, and outdoors is not as bad. The prudent thing to do, and it's what I intend to do, is just watch as these places reopen and see if you get clusters and of infection. And, uh, and, you know, you don't have to be the first one on the boat or at Disney, right. wait a little bit, watch, see right. what happens. And if everything's good, eh, maybe you can go. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my problem with the cruise is that it's not about getting sick, although that is what, uh, at the top, one of the tops, but the top is not being able to find a dock or someone let you off. Yes, that's right. So that's, that, that's why the first cruise I'm going on is a river cruise. That's right. <laughs> then I could just swim ashore. <laughs> For sure. So you got a second for me to ask you a quick question? Yeah, or oh, I bring I thought, it up next yeah, week? That wasn't the question, whether I was negative. Okay, what's the question? Yes. <laughs> um, how about for podcasting? You know, these 39 travel questions I do, Zoom sends me a file, an audio file. Sure. And I was like, you know what? Why don't I just upload it to a, a podcast? Which one do you recommend? Use anchor.fm. You can upload it to Anchor FM. You can add music if you want or not. And they turn it into a podcast to put it on iTunes and everywhere else. It makes it very, very easy. They store it for free. There's no cost. It's kind of the the YouTube of uh, pod, of audio podcasts. Okay. And you rec I mean, I heard of them, but you recommend them. Absolutely. Yeah. I've okay. used them. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. They're owned by Spotify now. They'll be around for a while. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. Well, um, I'm glad you're doing well. Uh, there's some dispute over whether my negative test even means that I'm negative, but even if... Even if I'd got, which of course, you know, uh, that changes nothing. If I'd gotten positive, then we'd have to have a conversation about what the hell that means. Right. Yeah. I would do one more to see, you know, but. Yeah, but then what know, am they, I going to do? Well, they even say 5 to 15% of people in China have gotten it again. So. Yeah. Right. And I, Seoul just came out yesterday saying that, you know, they, they're going to shut down bars again because. Um, they're starting to get more yeah. cases because they open up the bars. See, that's why I'm going to watch with interest to see what happens with this slow reopening. And we'll know what we can do. We'll know how far we can go. It's all still a little bit of a mystery. We don't we don't know everything we need to know yet. 
And next week, by the way, we could have talked about like states that are not allowed. Like P Maine does not want any outsiders. If they, you do come, you have to stay quarantined for two weeks. And so, I mean, countries are like that and their states beginning to be like that. Right. And besides, I mean, Hawaii for sure. Hawaii is the most vigilant. Yeah. I wish I could go to Hawaii, but they won't let me in. <laughs> Actually, you know, I got, I realized the last time I was in Hawaii, we went to uh, Kauai. It's too remote. It's beautiful and I love it, but you're kind of in the middle of nowhere. It's too remote. Yeah. I need to be, I need to be, I need to be in nature, but I need to be able to get in a car and get somewhere. I'm with you. I'm the same way. I'm, yeah. I'm more of a city guy. Yeah, I like the city. I don't want to live in a city anymore. I need to live near a city. Exactly. So that way, if there's an emergency or you need supplies, you can yeah. just... Yeah, yeah. Plus, you can get deliveries. Yes. <laughs> All right, John. Stay right, take care. care. Stay healthy. Take care. Take Thank care of the fam. Thank you. You too. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Now, you listen to that. And you go, yeah, Little Richard invented rock and roll. <laughs> it's, it's true. You can hear his influence everywhere. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888-ASK-LEO, line three, Linda, Los Angeles. Hello, Linda. Hi, Leo. Hey, Linda. Boy, it's so nice to talk to you. I've listened to you for forever. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's welcome. have been a fan for a long, long time. Oh. First time I've called, though. So this is really wonderful. First time. That's what you, you're a first time, call, long time listener, first time caller, as they say. That's right. I yeah. am. Well, really good. Am. And you have, but you have helped me so much through the years. I have, I have really been led to different places for, from you. And so um, you've never led me astray. <laughs> well, let me lead you astray now that, no, no, that's okay. wrong. No, no. <laughs> Let's keep our perfect record. Okay, okay let's do it. <laughs> what do you need to know? Well, I have many text messages that are really important to me. Plus, because of this um, staying at home all the time, I have a lot of Zoom messages that I have recorded. They've not been started by me. They've been something that I've been receiving. So okay. I've, I've, I have uh, recorded a lot of them, and they're all extremely important to me. Yes. What I would like to know, I know they're backed up, I think, on the cloud, but and I have iP an iPhone, but um, I want to know like this, the text messages, is there a way I can back them up and then print them out? Oh, interesting. So you're on an iPhone and everything that you're talking about is on the iPhone. Correct. Okay. So I can see it on my iPhone. I can see it on my iPad and my Apple, um, Apple uh, laptop. And but if you go into the settings on your iPhone, and you've already done this, obviously, because you can see them everywhere. But if you go in the settings on your iPad or your uh, iPhone, or even your Mac, but mostly on the iPhone. If you see, if you go in there, you'll see with iCloud, you can back everything up. You can even, with messages, store them on iCloud. So uh, all of that is backed up if you set it so. It doesn't, you don't have to. And one of the reasons you might not want to is because then you're going to have to pay for iCloud storage as you start to fill it up. But, right, and I do that. I don't mind doing yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, I, I encourage people to do it because then you have a backup. Right, exactly. Yeah. But what concerns me is I would really, it worries me, it still worries me that I'm going to lose these. These are so important to me. Uh, some, of the, some of the text messages, not all of them, and also the voice here's what emotion. Here's the easiest way to do it, and you, you don't have to, there is software you can get to do this, but the easiest way to do it is to mail them to yourself, email. Oh. So if you go to the message app on your phone and you say, oh, I really want this, and it's, by the way, not by message, but by conversation. Okay, good. You tap and hold the message, and uh, you can copy it, and copy it to the clipboard, and then go, and you can do that if you select all the messages in the conversation, or just one message. So you can copy whatever part you want. Okay. Then you go to the mail app in iOS, you open up a mail message, and you paste it. Oh, good. You've done two things by doing this. One, you're backing it up because you're mailing it to yourself. Right. Two, you can then print the message. Oh, that's great. From your email. So that's the easiest because that you don't need to get any extra software. There are programs. Uh, Ecamm makes a program uh, that will do this. There are a lot of companies that make uh, programs that will take data off of your iPhone and let you print it and stuff. But they're more complicated. And this, if you're, if you're content to do that, 
I think I you're fine. Be. Yeah. And then if you go into somebody telling me, and this may be the case, you know, if you if you do turn on this save messages in the cloud and your messages are showing up on your Mac, your old messages as well as any new messages, then somebody said you can actually print directly from uh, messages on the Mac. I have not tried that, but if that's the case, that would be even easier. Great. I will check that Check out. if there's a print option. Yeah. That is fabulous. And then what about voice memos doing an extra backup for them? Um, just so I don't, I don't miss them. I don't yeah. lose them by that's a, and I get this question a lot because, uh, and this is challenging because, um, your voice messages, there's no really uh, easy way to back those up. So you, this one, you do need a third-party program. And the one I recommend comes from a company called Ecamm. It's called PhoneView. Now, if you're going to go out and get this, and its I don't think it's very expensive. It's maybe, uh, yeah, it's $30. If you're okay. going to go out and get this, you can then use PhoneView on your Mac to print out the messages, to save them. But you can also uh, get your voicemails and save them onto your Mac. Um, so That's this great. really is a way of uh, treating your iPhone more like a storage device than a, than an iPhone. So okay. anything that's on your iPhone becomes your, you know, becomes like a file on your Macintosh. Oh, that's great. Because yeah. I'm just so worried about. Um, I, I I always back everything up. I have on you know online backup and all of that. Oh, I, no, you I'm have been listening. You have been. <laughs> thank you, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Yet, well, I, I listen to you. Yes, I think you're. I think you took you took a good. Uh, uh, you learned a lot. That's good. I did. I, I've learned a lot. I really have. So you're gonna like. I think eCam for people who want to extract data from their iPhone like voicemail it's I, there are a few other ways to do it but they all involve third-party software apple does not give you a way to do that ecamm is the easiest the best ecamm.com and the program is called phone view yeah i got that down and it's for max yeah that's great oh, and, and, that's the, and the, the chat room has checked and mac os messages does have a simple print message so that's forget the email thing you can just print oh. it right from uh, messages on the mac as long as you're syncing and that's yeah. the key yeah yeah, I will make sure that I'm thinking. I'm yeah. pretty sure I am, but yeah. I will go and check and, and make sure that I am. Oh, this is great. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, Linda. My pleasure. I really appreciate it. Nice to it. talk to you. Don't be a stranger now. I, I definitely will not be. <laughs> <laughs> First <laughs> time's a little scary, right? But then once you yeah, do it, it's yes, like... I'm sitting here thinking, drinking water, and I'm thinking, oh, God, don't let my voice go away. <laughs> no, no, no. You see, it's easy. It's just, uh, it's just us friends. We're just, yeah, thank just you, two thank people you. talking. I tried to think of it just talking to yeah. you. Just Nobody, you. Nobody... Well... <laughs> I wish more people listened, but frankly, it is just us. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great day, Linda. Stay oh, healthy. You too. Thank you. My pleasure. Take care. Uh, Kathy on the line from Southern California. Hello, Kathy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Uh oh. Did I push all buttons correctly? Hi. There. Oh, there. Oh, why? Hi, Kathy. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. My Long pleasure. time listener, first time caller. Oh, nice. Two in a row. Thank you. <laughs> I have, um, I think, a rather dumb question. I probably should know the answer to this, but you're the... You're the no, no, you're... please. People say, oh, it's a dumb question. That's the best kind, because then I can sound smart. Oh, you're so nice. Well, I have a niece. She's newly graduating um, from college. Yay. She got a part-time job, but she's Yay. a contractor. Yeah, on the road. I loaned her, gave her my Dell 18-inch um, laptop. Oh, you're she's so sweet. Doing... Um, but she, she needs internet access remotely. Right. She doesn't want to tether her phone. Um, but I'm trying to figure out. No, she has to. That's not gonna no, no she out. has to tether the phone. <laughs> oh, okay. So the, the other thing you could do is buy something that will be a remote hotspot for her. But as she's driving around, unless some, there are machines, some machines that have built in LTE, you know, cellular access. That Dell is not one of them, I don't think. But if, but no, check, yeah. Okay. Then otherwise, you can buy her. Sometimes they call them a MiFi, and it just go to any carrier. You can do it online and say, I need a, a Wi-Fi access point that gets cell data. Now oh. you, you you'll be Aunt Kathy. You'll be paying for this unless you get her to pay for it. But that no, will give her data anywhere she goes, and it's just like doing a hotspot with her phone, except it's not a phone. It's just a little credit card size device. I love it. Oh, see, you are the man with all the answers. You see? So you see? Hey, congratulations to all the 2020 grads. Absolutely. Oh, man. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, Kathy.
first, a word from our sponsor. And I know you know these guys. Simply Safe. Everybody. Everybody. Stay safe. Now, I know you say, well, hey, I don't have to have a Simply Safe anymore because I'm home all the time. That actually, if you think about it, is an even better reason to have home security. You're home all the time. You don't want somebody going, I'm going to break in anyway. Simply Safe. We all need a little psychological kind of security blanket. And that's what Simply Safe is for me. Feeling safe at home is more important than ever. Simply Safe Home Security, I've been recommending them for years. The story is great. It was a, it was a young couple, uh, Harvard educated, MIT educated engineers. They were renters. They said, I don't like this idea of having an alarm company come in, install sensors, screw them into the wall. We don't even own this place. Then we have to pay $45 a month for monitoring. We're going to make a better way. And they did. And they were actually, over the years, Simply Safe has become the best way, the most popular way to protect your home. It started out great for renters because you don't need an installer. You just peel and stick, and they have all the sensors you can want. Nobody's got to come in your house. No contact. They'll ship it to you. You install it yourself. And they have motion detectors, glass break sensors, window and door open sensors. They have water leak sensors. They have everything. Carbon monoxide, cameras. It all goes to, to this home unit, this base station, which is indestructible. And the best 24-7 monitoring with no contract, no fees, at a third the cost of the other guys. Just 50 cents a day. You'll be able to set yourself up in an hour, and you're protected 24-7 with emergency dispatch for break-ins, for fire, for anything. Water leaks, whatever you need. And police respond faster to Simply Safe because they can verify that there is an actual break-in happening. They don't, you know, they know we're not getting false alarms from Simply Safe. U.S. News and World Report said Simply Safe is simply the best overall home security for 2020. Right now, if you go to simplysafe.com slash twit, you'll get free shipping and a 60 day risk free trial. I think I'm thinking you want to be safe at home. You want to feel safe at home. You're sleeping at night. You want a good alarm system. You don't want somebody coming in the garage or the back door. You want that feeling of security, but you don't want a guy coming and installing it. Not these days. You want Simply Safe. Put it up yourself in an hour, get exactly what you need, pay less, and get great 24 7 professional monitoring for much less money with no contract. It's a 60 day risk free trial. Go to simplysafe.com slash twit. Simplysafe.com slash twit. Please use that one so they know you're here to hear. From Simply Safe and, and, of course, all of us here. Stay safe, stay healthy. SimplySafe.com slash twit. Thank you, Simply Safe, for keeping us safe and just kind of giving us some peace of mind. It's important. Well, hey, 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 how are you today, Leo Laporte? The tech guy. 8888 Ask Leo, the phone number. If you have a question, a comment, a suggestion, you want to talk high tech, that's what I'm here for. It's just kind of a little get together we do uh, every weekend at this time, just kind of. You know, people interested in technology, talking about technology. doesn't have to be all problem-solving, although, as you can see, I kind of like doing that. And by the way, I know I can't answer every question, but uh, we've got a pretty good team of people. All this, all these people listening on our 200 stations all over the country, they have good answers. They can call in. We also have a great chat room, irc.twit.tv. That's where Team Tech Guy lives. Those are some pretty, pretty advanced nerds sitting in there waiting for... <laughs> Wait for your question. Uh, 8888 Ask Leo. And of course, the website is a great place to go to not only ask, but to answer questions. Uh, it's free, it's open to all. Techguylabs.com. There's no sign up. Our, show, uh, our shows are there. Every show we've done, this is 1,600 something. We're almost to 1,700 shows. The audio and video is there from previous shows, but also the uh, there's text of the answers to the questions, the questions and their answers. But you can also go into that part and say, I have a better answer, or I have another idea, or what about this? And I really appreciate if you do that. I don't take I don't take it as an insult by any means, because there's always many ways to answer any given question, and I know I don't have the right answer all the time, so that's fine. Correct me. But uh, do it on the website, tech, or on the phone, too, is okay. TechGuyLabs.com. No sign up. It's free. 
Chris in Burbank is next. Hi, Chris. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? Good. So I have an issue. I have a. Uh, I live in a condominium that's built in the 60s, uh, so you can kind of hear every single thing that the neighbors do. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. That doesn't sound like fun at all. <laughs> no, no, it's not. So I have a problem. I, you know, I like tech, so I have a 65-inch Samsung HD 4K, um, Ultra HD 4K. Okay. But the sound, obviously, is the standard sound. So oh, I'm yeah. What kind of a sound bar can I get? Do you want to drive the neighbors nuts or not? Uh, not drive the neighbors nuts, but I also want to be able to enjoy my TV. <laughs> yeah, this is the challenge in an apartment. Uh, you know, I like big TV sound, and uh, I've always, uh, you know, I've added speakers, particularly subwoofers. The low frequency stuff really drives the neighbors crazy. I bet you'll hear them when if they play music. What you mostly hear is boom, boom, boom yeah, coming through exactly. the walls because the high frequency sound tends to be stopped by the walls, but the lowest frequencies go right through them, <laughs> and it's so annoying. So uh, you, I'd be careful about getting a subwoofer. There are sound bars that have subwoofers. This certainly enhances the sound. And when you get your own home, uh, I would get two subwoofers and say, take that, world. I like it. But until then, um, sound bars are a great way to give yourself a, a richer, more uh, uh, enjoyable sound, but also more intelligible sound at a fairly low cost and you can yeah if you don't get a subwoofer and you and you get a, a sound bar that's aiming into your apartment not not across the wall you could probably do a do it without bothering the neighbors too very much so in particular if if it's, if it's cost isn't a huge issue but i imagine if you're just talking about a sound bar they're not oh they're they you can get them for 50 bucks you can get them for five thousand dollars it really Ugh. depends yeah so i'm not going to recommend no i wouldn't do that to you scott wilkinson uh -huh. last week talked or maybe it wasn't scott somebody last week talked about sonos has a new i think 800 dollars sound bar and the sonos sound bars are quite good but uh, I think that price is a little uh, out of control. Last week, Scott did mention a soundbar he liked a lot. Now I'm going to have to remember it. You you put me on the spot here. <laughs> does anybody does anybody remember the soundbar that uh, Scott was talking about? I wish I could remember. Let me see if he I reviewed know you it. Heard, I heard you mention something about a Roku soundbar a while back. I didn't know. Yeah, if yeah. I would. I, I don't know if I would recommend that. Um, okay. In the past. We've recommended sound bars from a lot of different companies. Vizio, I think, is probably the one I would recommend. Uh, but he just he Vizio. just was talking. Was it was it the Vizio? I don't think so. Klipsch has a good sound bar for about three hundred dollars. Vizio is about half that. Uh, and and it, if you want, Vizio even has one. It's a little more expensive. That does Atmos. I'm not sure. Are the neighbors above you too? There's neighbors above me. I'm not super worried about him. The, the mostly would be that actually it's not the see the the TV itself is not on an adjoining wall, but the couch that I sit on is, and so it's the neighbors that would be basically you know, on the other side of that. Couch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he did talk last week about the Sennheiser Ambio, but that's two thousand five hundred dollars. So we're not gonna <laughs> we're not gonna we're not gonna go there. The TV. <laughs> no, I would I would look at the Vizio V I Z I O soundbars. They have a range of prices. Uh, the of course, the more you spend, the better the sound will be. Uh, particularly in terms of sub, the low frequencies. Mm -hmm. So uh, generally, you, you know, if you want a low frequency, you're going to have to have a big speaker to move that much air. That's why they tend to put them in subwoofers, which are standalone boxes with big, one big cone in them. So you're not going to put yeah. that in a sound bar. So you're not going to get a lot of bass, but you can get a little bit better bass. The more expensive Vizios also have, and this is why I asked about your neighbors upstairs, upward firing speakers to give you Atmos sound. So they bounce the sound off the ceiling. I think that's oh, okay. I think that's kind of silly. I wouldn't spend a lot of money. Um, right. v, I would say Vizio, and there are a range of them. Scott was talking about the Vizio last week, I guess, so you could go back to the last week's show. I don't remember what model number he recommended, but all of the Vizios, I think, are, are a good good bang for your buck. Um, are worth it? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Probably don't. I wouldn't go for um, one with um, 
a subwoofer <laughs> just yeah, just yeah, for yeah. the neighbors the neighbor below me definitely is, is probably my biggest concern is the one that complains the most would be the one below me yeah so then you know, definitely right. don't want that but uh, but yeah. for 179 dollars they have a 36 inch uh soundbar you don't need a subwoofer uh you don't need atmos either you don't need that stuff that fires upward either i think that's kind of silly so you're in a you're in a good price range well under 200 dollars for almost all the okay. all the vizios they're yeah. really good yeah all right, that'll be perfect. And they, you know, I see a, a Vizio with built-in dual subwoofers. I can't imagine they'd give you much bass. Okay. But if you, yeah, it's too bad we can't go listen to them these days. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I'm locked in, so it's like I guess I don't have much of a choice. Well, and this is, but this is a good time to upgrade your uh, TV sound, right? Yeah. You, sh you should enjoy it as best you can. Honestly, especially if you're in an apartment and you have neighbors. I think the best way to go is with headphones because you can crank it and really mm -hmm. enjoy it. And headphones are going to be less expensive. Problem is, you you know, you need a wire between you and the TV. That may not be the best way to go either. But it's certainly the case that any sound bar will be much better than the built-in TV sound. So yeah, go with the Vizio. Like 30, and then it's about the same the entire time. And yeah, no, it's terrible. It also solves a problem Scott was talking about last week with centered channel sound where you can't hear the voices very well. Uh, Vizio makes a 36-inch soundbar that has uh, dual subwoofers, which aren't going to be too deep, but at least give you an appearance of bass. And that's $140. I think that's probably a very good way to go. So $140. All yeah. right. I'll go give those a look. Yeah. They're on Amazon. Right. They're everywhere. You can buy uh, audio gear. Hey, thanks for the call. Enjoy your sound. And, you know, the nice thing is if you get something like this and the neighbors are annoying you, now you have weapons. Now you... <laughs> Now you have something you can do about it. You know what I'm saying? Can you dig where I'm coming from here? Oh, yeah, neighbors? Oh, yeah? Take that. <laughs> boom, boom, akalakalaka, boom, boom, boom. Leo Laporte, akalakala, boom. The tech guy, 88, 88, ask Leo. Uh, thank you, Lady Laura, our musical director. Perking up the, perking up the place here, with their musical selections. Paul in Columbus, Ohio. Hello, Paul. Akalaka boom. Akalaka okay. boom. <laughs> <laughs> Not first time, but it's been a while. A um, couple things actually. I, I talked about the speakers. Such as um, when I moved, we moved to a new house here about four years ago, a little over. And I had a couple of JBL speakers then, and shortly thereafter bought the uh, Pioneer Andrew Jones speakers. Those are the ones, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I got I got those and, and a subwoofer. Okay, and remember, after, this is shortly after we'd moved in, and uh, had an older Denon receiver. And so these things sounded pretty darn good. Yeah, no kidding. Well, yeah, okay. But then you... and. Um, uh, Scott started to talk about the center channel situation, which is really helpful for us because my wife and I are 70 and, you know, it's like uh, trying to hear that stuff coming through on the sides. So I got a small sound, a small speaker that I had was not fantastic, but it's decent. As a center channel. Uh, as, yeah. As a center yeah. channel, put, the, put that sucker on there. The other thing I did, though, was I forgot that I had never ran the Odyssey and oh, with the, with the new speaker. Right. This is a feature that some receivers have where they have a microphone and you put the microphone where you would be seated and they run through a bunch of funny sounds and they test the speakers and then adjust them for your room. It's a really good idea. Exactly. Well, this is, like I said, this is a several year old Denon and it had that feature. And I said, you know, well, what the heck, we'll rebalance it. Because I never balanced it with the with the subwoofer. Anymore. Yes, it's a it was a difference between night and day. Oh yeah, it is. I cannot believe the difference. I mean, they sounded good to begin with before, but that just like, no. It's a very good tip. Every room has different characteristics, acoustics. When you add speakers, you're really changing the setup. And so, uh, if you if you're lucky enough to have a receiver that has it, Odyssey is one brand. A U D E S S E Y. Uh, this one I have on my uh, Denon as well, but there are others. Other some systems have their own, but if your system came with a microphone, you bet. Change the room, change the even if you change a chair, you should you should run the Odyssey again. 
Yeah. Almost tossed that microphone away a couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah, it's good you kept it. Yeah. <laughs> it's the one with a really long wire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I put it on a tripod and it worked perfectly. It, it is a very, very good idea to do that. That center channel just makes a heck of a big difference for understanding stuff in movies. And, and I wouldn't blame your age or, you know, aging ears, even though I, like you, have the same issue. It certainly becomes exacerbated with age, just like reading a menu in a... Those restaurants seem darker all the time. But <laughs> but it also, I think, is the... And, and maybe even more uh, uh, the cause of it is that more and more of what you're listening to is mixed for a center channel. As more home systems have 5.1 sound, um, yep. They're just assuming, oh, he's going to have a center channel. We're going to put the, the dialogue in the center channel. And if you don't have it, it's muddled in with everything else. So I don't think it's completely us. I think it's also right. the way stuff is mixed these days. Well, what I told Kim I was calling about was and I, I, a couple of confessions here. I guess I'm missing things. I am visually impaired, so I might have missed something in the software. But I've, I'm, I've got iDrive and, and like it a lot. It, I've got it on my iPhone Good. and the uh, computer I'm, I'm running Windows 10 on. But are we or are we not supposed to be able to access cross, like I could should be able to access files off my phone on the computer and vice versa? Oh, that's a good question. I, I, that's a really good question. It would, you know, on a norm, the way normal backups work, uh, there's one big repository where everything is, and you can look at them. I don't think iDrive works that way. I think it's per device. But, I do, but you know, I've never tried it the other way, so I don't know. Well, the reason I wondered or thought it might be is because uh, Carbonite, which I've used and will be dropping here in July when my subscription is up because it's just gotten to be a little strange. Yeah, they've moved yeah, away from consumers. They really want yeah. to support business well, now. Yeah, with that one I can access. I can access. Yeah, uh, computer. But files. but if you remember, your Carbonite account was per computer. Yeah, but I could. Act, but still, I could access the files. From like that were on the computer from, from the somewhere iPhone. else. As long as you sign into your uh, account, yeah. Yeah, you know, okay. you got me on this one. I I am not an iDrive expert. I view I use it uh, kind of just generically. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I never even thought of trying to see if I could see the files on another device. Um, well, I think fair. not, and I think that's because that's that concept is more cloud storage. The idea that you've got uh, one repository for everything, and I think they're really focusing on per device backup and restore. Yeah, which that makes sense, and that's perfectly fine as long as I'm not expecting it. I won't worry. Yeah, about it. Uh, and I'll and I'll I'll inquire, but my my guess is not. And and for that, you want something you know a cloud storage system, and I do that as in addition to iDrive. That's probably why I never tried it. Uh, I, you know, there's Dropbox and, uh, there's, you can do roll your own stuff. I use a, another service I, that shall remain nameless cause I don't want anybody to yeah. know I'm on it. Yeah. Uh, but the, <laughs> only cause I don't want people attacking my account and trying to get my stuff. Sure. But, uh, but well, I'll say the name pcloud.com. I really like that. I, the, and they've, there's some features of that, including encrypted files. But the whole idea there is I have a documents folder there that all my systems share, including my phones and everything. And uh, they all back up to, they all sync to. It's not, and the reason I think this is why iDrive doesn't do that. There is the risk that a phone could change a file, and then it, well, that's true. and then it could be changed everywhere, and you don't want that. Yeah. So I bet you that that's one of the reasons they they would not do that. You, the, the, and I that's something a risk I live with with P Cloud is my documents folder. I want my documents folder identical everywhere. Right. Yeah. And so as a result, um, I back up and sync on every machine to that documents folder. So if I change something on one machine, it's changed everywhere. That yeah. may not be the behavior you want for backup. That's a different kind right. of behavior. Okay. okay, something else real quick. Uh, you were talking about uh, voter stuff the uh, last couple of weeks. If we can have software on our phones and go to automatic uh, teller machines and transfer money as as much as people do and as much as banks tr transfer stuff, how can we not come up with a voter system that would be s safe and, uh, and usable? Yeah, yeah, although there have been mistakes made with bank accounts and ATMs. Oh, sure. Oh, and sure. they stand no. behind it. I mean... 
if it's a small percentage, we could probably tolerate the same kind of things. I think the main reason, the main concern, and again, this is something we've talked about before, and I've heard from a lot of security experts who say, heaven forfend online voting. The main concern is this lack of a paper trail. Um, it seems like it would be solvable, doesn't it? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah. Ironic, I drive is down right now. <laughs> I'm sure they'll get it. I'm sure they'll get it back up. Because I wanted to check for you. There is a um, the the FAQ. There is a page on it, but I can't get to it talking about uh, this issue of well, I can, sharing I can look data. That up. It, it, yeah. it, you know, I haven't played with a lot because I do still. Have I'd be my guess that they that this is a conscious issue, decision but... to keep people from accidentally. Uh, modifying yeah. the backup, right? Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Total, total sense. Yeah. But, you know, the, on the voting thing, I don't, you know, and I totally agree with you about the paper trail, or there should be some way. Well, and with, interestingly, with an ATM, you do have a paper trail. Yeah. Well, you could do that too. You know. You but you can't, though, with online voting. If I'm doing it on my phone, what's the paper? You could send, I guess I could you print it out. Your, yeah. Send me an email. Or, or something. It's just. Um, if I, it just like I say, I, I, you know they, that there are mistakes and, like you say, losses on, on bank transactions and stuff, too. But uh, it can't be too big or they, they wouldn't continue to do it. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's a, yeah, no, I agree. And, and, you know, even if there were a small percentage of error in voting, there's so many people using it. I don't – that's a really uh, good question. There, If you're really con concerned, there are a lot of great resources on – uh, online voting or just voting security. Um, the one right. we I've done a number of interviews with uh, with these guys. It's really a fascinating uh, topic, and there's some very serious um, computer scientists and crypto guys working on this whole idea. What was the name of the uh, site? There was a site. Um, if I could remember the name that. It was a, a nonpartisan uh, site, up not and not specifically about election uh, interference and things like that, but just on the technology of voting that was mm -hmm. quite good. And I just don't remember off the top of my head. If I can find it, I'll put it in the show notes for you. Great. Um, yeah, the machines that we use at, at, at polling places are horrible. I mean, well, that's the problem. Right now, we have we, yeah, we're the worst of both worlds. <laughs> exactly. And I think exactly. if your goal is to get uh, as many people to vote as possible, making it easy to do on a phone, especially to get these young people who really don't vote, get them to yeah. vote uh, would be really a worthwhile project. So exactly. um, well, I, I, it's worth I looking was out at. The, I was out in San Rafael uh, last June and I was hoping to get up to see it. Oh, I'm sorry you didn't. But I was, yeah. uh, I was getting a new guide dog and it just got Got oh yeah, that's we get visitors who go get their guide dogs in San Rafael and then come here with them. And I love that. I love to meet yeah. the dogs and the and their owners. It's really fun. Yeah, she's amazing. Next she's time, yeah, you happy? She's oh, that's nice. Uh, oh yeah, she's my third, and from there, and it, it's they're they're wonderful. Oh, they, they uh, do such a great job. It's so neat. They're unfortunately not able to train anybody right now because of all this. No. So they got people backed up, but uh, you forget. You know, it's so easy to forget. All of the little things that no longer work. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, because we're all in our little bubbles now, even more than ever. Um, yep. It's really an interesting uh, time we're in. I hope we can get out of it and have great stories to tell our grandkids. And, and meanwhile, back to the cruise ships. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's great to talk to you. Love it. See you, you next too. time you're out here. Thanks, Paul. All right. Take have care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, man. Lady Laura, you're playing the best stuff. And I have to apologize because I was digging, walking the dinosaur with was not was. And I didn't even know at the time that Sweet P, Hillard's Sweet P Atkinson, the vocalist of was not was, the guy singing boom, jackalaka laka boom, had passed away this week as well at the age of 74. So we're mourning two greats, <laughs> Little Richard and... Uh, Sweet P. Atkinson. Is this is this singer dead? Anything you want to tell me? Okay, good. All right, just checking. Just checking. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, just checking because Lady Laura will she'll sneak those in, you know. 
She will. <laughs> uh, there is a site uh, we were talking about uh, online voting, uh, and I don't want to just be a a robot and parrot what I've heard, but I've talked to a lot of security professionals and experts, and universally. They say, yes, it's a great idea to make it as easy uh, for people to vote, especially young people who just aren't getting to the polls. And online voting by phone seems like such a great idea. But almost, I've never talked to one security expert who says, but it doesn't. You can't. It's not safe. It's insecure. It's a bad idea. There are there are people trying to figure this out, though, and I had mentioned uh, to our Paul, our caller uh, last, that I would uh, find a site for him. It's a site about voting and voting technology called verifiedvoting.org. Verifiedvoting.org. And they have a lot of resources online there about the voting equipment we use. And, of course, that's county by county, state by state. There's no national system, even for national elections. Uh and information, though, about Internet voting. They have uh, an entire page on Internet voting and some of the proposals because there are a lot. People are working on this. They want to solve it. And I would hope it's solvable. But this fundamental issue, and I'll, and I'll quote from verifiedvoting.org, there's no way to guarantee that the security, privacy, and transparency requirements for elections can all be met with any practical technology in the foreseeable future. It's just too easy to remotely attack an online election to modify or filter ballots in a way that is undetectable and even worse, uncorrectable. Or even just disrupting the election with a DDoS attack and creating havoc. So as much as I think many of us like the idea, I mean, we do everything else online, right? And as Paul pointed out, we get money from banks online all the time. But uh, it's so important that, you know, our elections be trustworthy and that they be seen as trustworthy. Very important for the legitimacy of any election that people can say, no, no, we have a system that works and it can't be easily hacked, modified or disrupted. That's really important. So this is a challenge. Not that we haven't had technology challenges before that we've uh, triumphed over. We've overcome. And as I remember, I think the best site for this is verifiedvoting.org if you want to read more. We've had a couple of people now uh, talking about this, so I just wanted to pass that along to you. This is a great site just to find out about the systems we are using, and frankly, many of them are worse. <laughs> They're terrible. And maybe a chance for us to, to do better on that. Ron in Charlotte, North Carolina is next. Hi, Ron. Hey, Leo. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? Doing good. Still, still under quarantine. So, as we all are, even when they lift it, which I know that in some states they're doing, who wants to be the guinea pig? <laughs> Not me. Uh, Not well, me. Although I need a haircut badly, as as people have observed. Yeah, I, I was I was I was talking to a buddy of mine and observing you online, and I said, "Yeah, Leo needs a little trim here." Or there, so. shaggy. I'm really tempted. I bet you Floby sales are through the roof right now. They are, and <laughs> I will say that I do have my Twit mask on order. I'm just waiting. Oh, good. Yeah, we thought it was kind of fun. We offer uh, merchandise for a podcast network, twit.tv slash store, and the company that does the merch said, hey, we have masks. So, yeah, I've, I've ordered a bunch of them. I'm going to wear my Twit mask with pride. <laughs> I think masks might become a fashion statement. There you, yeah, they, right? yeah, I think it will be. <laughs> so, Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it, Ron. The, the, the reason the call was, and I think I found it while I was uh, waiting, but um, using, I got an Android um, S8 active or whatever, but using, when I take a selfie and the picture comes out, it's mirrored, you know, it's flipped wrong. Oh, it drives me crazy. And I, th I think I found, I think the chat room gave me a, I found the option. I think I got it. To yeah, it's in the camera settings. You can flip it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, but I was just curious, are there any other recommendations for better camera software other than what comes on no the if you if you're using the google now i don't know uh what phone do you have it's a um, it's a samsung it's a okay active. so here's the here's the issue samsung makes a camera app that's the one you're using that's the default that takes right. advantage of features that they've built into the hardware is it the best camera app? Maybe not. It's the best one if you want to take advantages of the features they built into the hardware. But Google's camera, Gcam, 
can also be downloaded. Sometimes you have to jump through some hoops. So there are other camera apps you can use, including uh, Google's own Gcam software. Now, that's not available on the Android store. You'll have to you'll have to kind of do some tricks to get that on there. Or maybe it is. Maybe it is, actually. I would check the, the yeah, Google camera. Check and see. Okay. Uh, Samsung may block that. If so, there are ways to get it on there. The thing is, it's just a generic camera. It doesn't understand all the features of your Samsung. So the Samsung camera is going to be able to do more of the things that the Samsung built in. The Gcam software, though, you may be better because it uses Google's uh, you know, artificial intelligence to improve the picture. I often uh, have multiple camera apps on my phone. Because, you know, there's some that are designed for time lapse. There's some that are designed for selfies. There's actually a, something called Selfissimo that Google released some time ago that does selfies like the black and white photo booth pictures, which are fun. So there's lots of choices out there. You don't have to stick with the, the one built into your phone. It's, though, the one that's going to understand your phone hardware the best. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the man who saved the match game. Shame. Dick D no, no, no shame in that. Dick D. Bartolo, he's Mad Magazine's maddest writer. He saved the match game when Mark Goodson and Bill Timer were about to cancel the show. He said, let me write the questions. And how many years did you do that? Uh, about seven or eight. Man, more than more than forty thousand questions. You invented Dumb Dora. You and oh yeah. yeah, you know it was it was name an apple, na I, I name uh, a green fruit, name a president on money, and it fit your style so well because you work clean, but you, there's something you love innuendo. You love plays on words and man you know you would write the jokes richard dawson would just go crazy it was so much fun i just loved oh, well, that thanks. show well it's still running i can't believe it yeah on the game show network and stuff on the well, game and show we network. had some fun uh you know we do these uh our podcast network we're we're all going a little crazy so we're doing these kind of after hours streams and uh we did one last night uh, and Dick very kindly decided to do the not the match game with some of our hosts. <laughs> it was so much fun. You are great, and you wrote oh, some you. really fun questions. And Lisa yeah. and I are playing along at home, and we're yelling our answers. <laughs> you know, what did he do in the torpedo tube? He did a podcast, you know, things like that. Oh, that's very, <laughs> very funny. It's a very funny modern answer. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but, you know, we weren't playing. Next time I'm playing. That's all I have to oh, say Oh, okay, okay, it. very good. Yeah, <laughs> give me a shout. I'll host it again anytime. It's, uh, it's, it's one of those things where people who grew up watching it, I, Christina Warren, who's now at Microsoft, was one of our players last night. This is like her dream. She emailed me and said, that was an honor being oh. on that show. That was so kind of well, her. We were honored, too. So Dick joins us. He's also, okay, so Match Game Mad Magazine, but maybe better known around here as our gizmo wizard, the guy who comes up with the great gadgets. What do you have for yeah. us? Leo, I have a very interesting idea for a lock. Actually, the company calls them security ties. And what this is for is you're out on your bike and you decide, oh, I'm going to run into Starbucks and grab a coffee. And you go, should I chance leaving the bike or oh, should I yeah. get out the padlock and the yeah. chain? So this is a real quickie way to lock your bike. It kind of looks like a tie wrap, except it has a flexible steel core so that you can lock the wheel to the frame so that it can't roll away. And this is not for locking your bike up overnight in New York City. This is for leaving your bike for 20 minutes. I thought a great use for this is at the airport where you can see your luggage, you want to go buy a magazine. Oh, yeah. You lock your, your suitcase to the bench so that someone can't just run through, get the bag and run on. They, If they want to do this, they have to stop and get out of pliers or sort of hack through it. Yeah, you just want uh, a, a speed bump. Uh, 
I, I, yeah, exactly. So they make two versions. The one of them is called the uh, hip lock Z lock combo, which has a little combination. The other one, the jury's out on this. This one is lighter weight, uh, much cheaper. It, ha it has a little key, and the key is like has two little points that unlock the lock. The problem is, once you have the key, it unlocks. All the zip locks. Oh, there's one key. For, it's like the TSA key. It unlocks yeah. everything. Oh. It locks them all. So you have to uh, wish you're the only person in your neighborhood who has this one. I like so you, I like having a bike lock with a key, though, because I, I don't want to have to remember a combination. The key just seems like an easier way to do it. Oh, okay. okay. But this well, is it's the same key for everybody. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. It's really, again, it's like, you know, do you ever watch a Western yeah, and they get they they, they ride up, you know, right in the town. They're all dusty. They want to go in the bar, have a shot of uh, red eye. They tie their horse up. All they ever do is just kind of loop it around a oh, thing. Yeah, I think yeah. you need a bike lock, dude. You got to lock you your horse, horse up. Lock. You a need horse, a horse lock. lock. You can't just throw the rope around a wooden beam and expect it what i mean did they have a horse thief problem or did they maybe it was just that's why they treated horse thieves uh, pretty badly i guess so we do have a bicycle stealing problem but i think if you give it just a little bit of a, a disincentive yeah they'll just exactly, go to the next bike exactly. that's not locked up at all yeah there you go there you go and so the the combo one is 25 dollars but I saw it on Amazon for 20 and the little guy that uses the same uh, key for every lock is like 12 bucks. Yeah. You know, enough so you might have, you know, a couple of them just lying around. Hip yeah. lock, H-I-P-L-O-K, Z-locks, L-O-K-S. Now, the easiest way to find this is to go to Dick's site, gizwiz.biz. And then there's a button there that says, you know, the gizwiz visits the tech guy. And a little kind of strange picture of me you click that <laughs> and everything he's ever mentioned on the show by the way is is on this so it's a it's a really a nice compendium there's other things at the website though i want to bring your attention to he first of all dick appears on world news now on abc uh, every month and so you can see the gadgets he showed there uh there's also the what the heck is it contest brand new contest began early may if you can identify that close-up picture of a lawn sprinkler, you're in. Oh! Oh, don't! Did I? Oh, oh, oh no. I gave it away. Right on the first guess. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it's not. Uh, you just go there, and, and there are six autographed copies of Mad Magazine for the right answer and 12 for the best cute wrong answer. And the judges' decisions are final, et cetera, et cetera. All the rules are at uh, gizwiz.biz, G-I-Z-W-I-Z. Dot B I Z. I like. It's fun to. Dick likes playing the games. There's actually. Are there? Is there any match game stuff uh, on the site too? Uh, there is some match game stuff. I have uh, some original questions uh, for sale. Like the cards and... that Gene Rayburn actually yeah, was the, reading. Yeah, the actual cards. Oh my goodness. That, yeah. Oh my goodness. Uh, the actual cards from the beginning. As Gene's vision got worse. The cards got bigger, and we had to get bigger type. Uh, bigger, he, we called IBM and said, "What's the biggest type you have?" Do they use and one we, of those selectrics? And you had a big one of the yes, typeface yes. balls. And, they, and that, they said, "They said, well, we have an all capital selectric." Oh, uh, and we said, "That's fine. We the cards can be in all caps." Yeah, yeah. I so. love this. So, and these are autographed by you. That would love. That would be fun to have an original match game question. Uh, anyway, gizwiz.biz, help help keep Dick <laughs> in the diets, diet root beer and pretzels. <laughs> Go, <laughs> yeah. That's about all you can get with these. Gizwiz.biz. Don't forget to play the What the Heck is It contest. And Dick, we will see you uh, back here next week. Very good. I'll all be right. here. Actually, Bye. I should mention after the radio show, Dick does uh, more match game stuff and other things. Uh, we call it the Giz Fizz. It's a little, uh, I guess, is it? Is it just live only? You just have to watch, you have to be here for it. Uh, of a Saturday well, you have to afternoon. be in your home, safely in your home. Safely in your home, not here. Your home. Yeah. <laughs> not <laughs> here not. in the studio, no. although we have had live studio audiences in yeah. years. Uh, well, by. it ends up on YouTube, uh, thanks to oh, good. Missed. Okay, good. So you can watch that a little later on. Perfect. Thank you, Dickie D. Okay, buddy. See you next week. See you next week. Well, the time has come. The old clock on the wall is telling me it's time to wrap this thing up. I want to thank Lady Laura, our musical director, 
for uh, memorializing the great Little Richard and Sweet Pea. Uh, playing some great music today. Thank you, Lady Laura. Thanks to uh, Kim Schaffer, our phone angel, for getting you ready for your appearance on national radio. Most of all, I want to thank all of you. I couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay well. And I'll see you next time. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Have a safe geek week. Bye -bye. Well, that's it for the tech guy show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week at Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security on Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.